If you look at the list of benefits that exercise provides, like look at the mental and emotional and psychological benefits. There are some physical reasons why or physiological reasons why you may get that like endorphin release and better dopamine and serotonin, all great. However, the a big chunk of the reason why you feel so much better is the struggle. The, yeah, and yeah. it's empowering and I'm doing something and it's working and then I can't, oh, this isn't working. Let me figure it out. Let me do it again. It's that growth process. Yeah, you can overcome challenges. You are not going to be able to mimic that with yeah. a pill. It's just not going to happen. Bro, based off of that, it's a very scary thought that it, we could even potentially. All right, here's some good news and some bad news. Let's start with the good news first. Scientists keep getting closer to designing exercise in a pill. Here's the bad news. You're not going to get nearly the same benefits you get from exercise, even if the pill makes you fitter, leaner, and stronger. So I wanted to bring this up because uh, I just read an article that they keep getting closer to so a- literal burpees. A drug yeah. that you take that can elicit the adaptation responses in the body that exercise does. Now, they're only testing it on animals, but it's pretty remarkable. Mm. However, I want people to- I don't want people to get excited, too excited, because when you look at the benefits, the list of the benefits of exercise, only a fraction of them will be accomplished with a pill, even if the, if it gives you all the physical benefits. I don't even think we're going to get there. Do you really believe yeah, we're going to get there? What does it look like? I, the, the, the complexity of that is insane. You're, I, I mean, think of the, think of the most uh, incredible pharmaceutical drugs that are out there right now that that aid in building muscle or or burning calories and speeding or and or uh, simulating speeding the metabolism up. And even those are, they're not magical. I mean, you think of the clenbuterols, yeah. the uh, anabolic steroids, like you take those, you can take copious amounts of those and it doesn't guarantee you get fit. You still have to put the work. Yeah, the in. only way you get strong is through the struggle. Yeah. So and how do you get strong by eliminating all well, the struggles? Well, and, and, and food. So food plays a, obviously a massive role with it. Plus the actual stimulus of the exercise, right? So how do you even... So I think they'll eventually be able to mimic the stimulus, but what they'll never be able to mimic what? with a pill, because why? Because it is a signaling process, mm. and they will. Look, they are going to eventually Well, that's what they said out. the uh, sauna emulates, right? It's like some very low form of exercise. But it's like, still... your body it's still But it still like, requires you go in and kind yeah, of go through yeah. it and all And that it's stuff. all still really minimal, just like it's I was talking about, minimal. like the, the clenbuterols and anabolic yeah. steroids... That, that makes a big difference, right? Someone utilizing things like that with exercise and diet, but you it's still really small in comparison to the diet and exercise part. Yeah, no, it, it'll yeah. get, it'll get, I think it'll get there. I think they're going to identify all really? the, the signaling processes that get the physical adaptations, the physiological physical adaptations, but what they won't do, and here's the complexity mm. part that you're talking about, what they're not going to get, because if you look at the list of benefits that exercise provides, like look at the mental and emotional and psychological benefits. There are some physical reasons why, or physiological reasons why you may get that like endorphin release and better dopamine and serotonin, all great. However, the, a big chunk of the reason why you feel so much better is- The struggle. The, yeah, and yeah. it's empowering, and I'm doing something, and it's working, and then I can't, oh, this isn't working. Let me figure it out. Let me do it again. It's that growth process. Yeah, you can overcome challenges. You are not going to be able to mimic that with wow. a pill, it's just not going to happen. Bro, based off of that, it's a very scary thought that it, we could even potentially... You're right, because yeah. people are going to think... I mean, imagine what we're seeing right now with the rise of depression and suicide mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Imagine if everybody could just take that pill and have that and think that that was going to provide happiness for them. How, how much worse it, it would well, be. To me, it looks just like this, like a, like a science fiction movie where you're in this like pod and you have like uh, electro stimulus to to keep your muscles basically uh stimulate so that way like let's say we're just now logged into the metaverse and so now everything's in there and i took this pill and so like it's regulating you know body fat giving me stimulus when i need it for my muscles like you could literally just be so now that seems a zombie that seems more realistic to me paired with your idea of a pill that actually, if you actually were to hook into something that is like stimulating the muscles while you take like this pill yeah muscle stimulus. You're still not going to get what I said. No, 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 no. I know, no, of course, yeah. but I mean, I, I still couldn't wrap my brain around a, a pill you take in your mouth, and all of a sudden you build muscle or you shred down body fat, like without some sort of like external stimulus. Yeah, yeah. Where I, if Justin is, where Justin's point is like hooking into a pod that you get this like stimulus, and then you're also 
getting the pill yeah. that's yeah. you're passively receiving this kind of like uh, and you um, wake up just jacked yeah, <laughs> yeah. i don't i don't That'd be kind of cool muscle i don't think the, yeah. i don't think the calorie you're, i don't think you're going to take a pill and then your body's going to burn more calories but i do think that the pill can stimulate the responses to do things like speed up the metabolism uh lower your appetite right you know here's a deal yeah but you can simulate fe good feelings or you could get good feelings from drugs too yeah you could take a drug and feel oh my god i feel so good is that the same thing as let's say a spiritual practice or being with your kids and experiencing joy that no, way it's not. not so you can mimic you can mimic the feelings of love with drugs you could take a drug and make you feel the feelings of love is it the same thing well yeah so okay no. you take a drug that get mimics you potentially building or but you don't actually build or burn <laughs> so no. i mean the the idea that you're we're going to have something that you could take and then it will actually build muscle or burn, i just can't i don't see that not I, without some sort of external Stimulus. Yeah, I think they'll be able to do it that, but I don't think they'll never be able to get you to actually go through the process or to figure that way that part out with a pill because that's the only way that it works. You have to go through the process unless we like the matrix yeah. where I could plug my brain into something it's, and then learn things and figure it out. It's going to go against uh you know our our makeup, our, our genetic makeup, our wiring, our, our drive uh, yep. to to move and and uh you know to be this sort of like machine like i i think that there's there's gonna be a lot of advancements like it, i was looking into uh the exoskeletons and everything else like we're already like building these attachments to kind yeah. of take replace limb strength so like who knows if we even like there's gonna be people that don't really care about like being strong or having like an able body because like we could just so, end up making it what yeah. okay so then are you do you lean more towards that we're gonna go in that direction where people have all these like mechanical parts and you're half human half robot or that we're gonna plug into a metaverse because they're two t totally different yeah or do you think they're both kind of know, it could be i way. think it's probably a combination of the two i'm convinced it's that it's the plug in because it solves the the fat loss body image stuff if you go plugged into a virtual world and you can create this character who can basically go around and do all the things that you could do in real life you know i think that it, that's more likely to happen than us getting to the science of a pill that so actually because yeah, you won't care about that anymore it'll solve the the looks aspect of it but not the health part you're still gonna be on no i'm not i'm not talking about solving a problem i'm talking about what we're more likely to go towards and what pe oh, humans are going to gravitate yeah. towards i think the the i think where we're moving with the metaverse is more likely to happen sooner and faster for people than you, the pill that you're alluding to right now i think so and and by the time you get into the metaverse and you no longer interact with people in real life anymore who gives a fuck if you're a hundred pounds overweight because your avatar looks the way you yeah. want it well to they'll care just because their health will be bad well here's what i think is no. gonna happen what? I, what? Yeah. What? Oh, you, they don't care. Wait, who cares that their health is bad? Do you know that they took this? What do you mean, I, who I just cares? read this. You're still going to feel like shit. I just read this crazy statistic. This is fascinating to me. Okay, people that go in and have like, uh, like, like almost die from like a heart attack or like any like something that they could and they it's induced because of you know poor diet, lack right, of exercise, right, right, right. and the doctor says. There's there's no nothing that can solve this other than changing your 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 habits yeah. and behaviors. You know what percentage do? It's still very small. Yeah, ninety percent don't change yeah, anything. Yeah, that's crazy. That's and they the, know, bro. They almost that's died. That's the epiphany part that people wait for. They wait for an epiphany, uh -huh. but epiphanies don't even happen when people literally almost die yes. or kill rock, someone. Rock bottom. Yeah, there's drunk. There's uh, there's alcoholics who will crash into someone, kill them, come out of jail, whatever, and still become alcoholics. Um, so yeah, waiting for an epiphany is not going to work. And we talk about this on the show all the time. There's a process of developing behaviors and discipline. It's a learning process yeah. and it takes a while and no pill is going to do that. And then as far as metaverse kind of stuff is, is concerned, I think, you know, what's interesting when you look at the science on happiness, like real happiness, joy and, and contentment and purpose, struggle is a very important part of it. And, and, and there are lots of pieces that don't make sense. Like why would challenge and struggle and hardship be a part of having to be happy? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, figure that out, right? It, Humans forces, are very it forces purpose. I think so. It forces purpose. Yeah, I think so. If there's struggle, it forces you to have to overcome, and that in itself gives you purpose. And that sucks. Purpose to live. And yeah. people don't want that. Right. They but don't it, want that. But it's better than being purposeless. Oh, I agree. It's better than, than floating around with no purpose whatsoever because everything is so easy and you don't need purpose. The fact that you have to overcome struggle forces us into You know what's funny purpose. is that, yeah. I mean, from an evolutionary standpoint, of course, you could go the spiritual standpoint, right? We're, we're all meant to grow and that's part of growth. And then there's the evolutionary standpoint, which is 
we evolved to uh, gain purpose from challenge and struggle because it was so a part of nature. Like there's no way to avoid challenge and struggle. So we evolved to find purpose in it mm -hmm. so that it became a part of who we were. Um, so as we continue to modify our environments with technology and whatever, make things easier and easier and easier, that part of us is still there. I always think it's interesting. You just did something that I think is always really funny to me that people do is this need that we need to separate evolution and, and spiritual. Like, why can't what you just say, like, be both? I agree. It's, 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 but it really is to make one half of the group feel good and the other half yeah, of the group right. feel good. By, I agree. By, it's like, dude, what are the possibilities of both? I, yeah, <laughs> you know no, I saying? totally agree. <laughs> I think it's so I, wild. I, I, here's know? why I agree with that, because what, uh, what we're learning right now is that we can't eliminate struggle and challenge. It's impossible. We can solve every problem. Mm -hmm. And you don't, if people are like, oh, that's not true. Look at this, the suicide rate among wealthy, popular celebrities. People who have everything that you think that you want, you know, sex, drugs, and acts and fame and love and you know, or and by adoration. the way, the power to not do all those things because there's people going like, well, that's not happiness, sex, drugs, all those, but they yeah. also have the power and the flexibility yeah. to not have all that stuff yeah. they want too. So it's interesting. It's like that, you know, it's funny. Uh, the the movie The Matrix was so it's so embroiled in very interesting philosophy. Like the scene where they're breaking into Morpheus's mind when he's in the Matrix and he's in that chair, and uh, Agent Smith says, you know, well, the first matrix that we designed was a perfect yeah. like utopia, but your feeble human mind yeah. couldn't accept it, and it. We lost whole crops. So we had to re we had to mimic you, you know, nine the nineties of your civilization or whatever, so that you guys could accept it or whatever. And I thought, wow, that is brilliant. Because that's exactly what happened. Oh. That was exactly what I think would happen if we, you know, we're the unfortunate part though is I think that we're still so drawn to having things easier. Welcome back to the best fitness podcast ever ever invented. It'll be, nobody will ever beat us. Okay. We had this discussion earlier and we decided no one's ever going to be better than mind pump. Anyway, you're back and I'm going to give away a program because we love you so much. We're going to give away maps anabolic for free, but you got to do the following and you got to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to maps anabolic. Also, we got a sale going on right now. The RGB bundle is 50% off. That's maps anabolic. Maps aesthetic, maps performance, plus a uh, kettlebell for aesthetics, plus the sexy athlete modification, plus the butt builder blueprint. All of that together, 50% off. Or you just want to get one program, maps suspension. This is a suspension trainer program. That individual program is 50% off. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code July50, July50, with no space, for that amazing discount. All right, here comes the show. Uh, you know, that the, I'm uh, listening to this book. I thought it was a really interesting stat, too, that you guys would find. So uh, it's uh, this book's called Never Split the Difference, and it's about an FBI uh, negotiator and, like, just the negotiating tactics and stuff like that. It's really interesting. One of the things they, they do is they, they- What a stressful job. I can't oh, imagine. my God. Can yes. you imagine? No. Well, and, and to get into, like, the FBI schooling, you have to first do, like, or well, they don't have to. They recommend that you do, like, a suicide hotline first. And so that's good training, I guess. Oh, it? of course, yeah. because they, they, they're, 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 they're told yeah. that you have tw 20 minutes or less, because if you take any longer than that, you're not doing your job. Like you're, you're just, it's dragging on. So your, your goal is actually obviously to, to help these people and then move on. But I, one of the things I thought was interesting and it fits into the metaverse talk is the uh, percentage of people that call in the suicide hotline. What percentage of them do you think are actually suicidal? Like actually suicidal? Yeah, the su it's a suicide hotline. I'd say like five percent. No, come on, bro. It's a suicide hotline. Oh, well, then I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go forty. Like actually gonna carry yeah, through, it's, or it's, they're it's just 40, looking for it's forty. It's forty percent. So, so 60, what are the sixty percent? Sixty percent are just energy vampires. Yeah. People, and they, in fact, they have rules that they can only call once a day because people call every day. Because it's a want, free person to talk it's to. It's a free person who, by the way, has yeah, got professional negotiating skills, to, to, has tactical empathy, <laughs> knows oh, how wow. to talk to you really well. Wow. And so they get this rewarding feeling from talking and engaging and interacting with someone because they're probably socially awkward and depressed and scared yeah. to be out in the real world. So they call in and 60% of these people that way that are just, they just want to talk to the-, wow. the yeah, Somebody that really actively listening. You know, that, yes. that's a huge thing that is a need for a lot of people. I couldn't, that, that there's a deficit there. I couldn't imagine testing that out either. Hey, hello, suicide hotline. Yeah, no, I don't want to commit suicide, but you know, I just had an argument with my wife and 
You know, so I just, you know, what do you think? Is she oh, right? He, Am I right? He, he, <laughs> in, the, in the book, it talks about how common it is that people will be like, yeah, this is Chris, and I haven't used my one time of calling today. I mean, they're so- Wow, I didn't wow. know that. Either did I. I thought it was so fascinating. I thought you guys would thought that was interesting. That is really, really interesting. I know, isn't it? Well, here's another one that's really interesting, okay? What have we been taught? All of our years of sales experience, and I, I think that everybody in here is pretty good at this. What are you taught to get a lot of, right? To get people to buy or to-, to Information. No, no, no. What else? What's what are you? What are you? A yes. Little yeses. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, yes. little yeses. yeses. No is a better strategy. Fucking think about that for a second. Because you want them to say no to suicide, maybe. Well, no. Forget suicide. We're talking about sales. Uh, oh. In sales in general. You, the power of al allowing somebody to say no leaves them in control of the conversation still. Oh. Getting a quick- so they think they're driving Getting it. a quick yeah. yes many times can completely be a false yes, a counterfeit yes. Because, oh, sure. Because someone I know feels- I know what that feels like. You totally do. And, yeah, I, and yeah. I know if you if you heard- You're the, getting pushed into it. The, if you heard the way he explains actually going after a no, you you go- And this oh, is in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Super. What's it called again? Uh, never split the difference. Interesting. And his a lot of what's really interesting is I talked about this book, uh, another book, last year or something like that. I think I told you guys about it. Uh, Daniel Kahneman or Kahneman, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. He's a Nobel Prize winning economist, behavioral psychologist who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. Hmm. He won his no Nobel Prize off of the learning about how the I told you guys how the brain it has two has two different ways of thinking or like the the, the fast, two hemispheres yeah the oh, faster oh, oh, no see. faster slow oh right, right the right. way you and your animal instinct is your fast and then your slow is your more cognitive mm -hmm. and 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 critical thinking a lot of the theories and everything that is this book is based off of come came from that research so it was and I found that out later of being in dude you just reminded me of so I've been reading a book mm -hmm. I'm only maybe a third of the way th or a fourth of the way through but it's called uh, the body keeps the score it's a heavy book it's about trauma and PTSD and how it affects the brain and the body and how these memories are stored in the body why it's so hard to process and mm -hmm. but it, in the beginning it kind of goes through the history which a lot of this came from, uh, a lot of the study on this originated with soldiers returning from war. And you know, it wasn't until the 1970s that they even came up with the term PTSD. PTSD yeah. So soldiers would come back from World War I, World War II, and they weren't treating them at all properly. In fact, oftentimes they were kind of Right, because I mean, they only pushed had, away. They only had one. It was like shell shock. Was that World War One? World War One, yeah. yeah. Were were because they were in the trenches and they'd constantly get bombed, and so they'd get the ground would shake, and they didn't know when the next one was coming. Yeah, that they, they they'd, they'd have tremors. They'd like, get tremors all yeah. the time. They call that shell shock. Really heavy but fascinating book. Like one thing that he talks about in there about with soldiers, which I've heard this before, but he tells a specific story. As he says, you know, um, you know, most people think that. Soldiers will suffer from PTSD from seeing like terrible things that happen around them, like their their buddies get shot or they almost die, they lose a limb. I totally. And he goes, that's that. a part of it. Yeah. He goes, but another part of it, the part that's very challenging to overcome, it's what you did, is what the soldier yeah. does in war yeah. and how they can't reconcile it For with sure. who they are. So he tells a story of this guy in Vietnam, where you know Vietnam was a was a really tough war because we didn't have a clear necessarily line or enemy. And they would go out on patrols constantly. Mm -hmm. And the enemies often look like villagers and you don't know what the... Anyway, this guy's going through and, and he tells a story how this guy was like a football captain, valedictorian, like great attitude, joined the military because his dad and his grandfather and his great-grandfather were always in the military. And he's on this patrol. They get ambushed and loses all his friends. They all die. So he literally, I think the day or two after, is so filled with anger and, venge and vengeance, he goes out and just terrorizes and kills a village. And that's what that's what torments him yeah. is he can't reconcile what he did right. in that state. And it's and and the, the the guy says that it's so hard that some of these guys don't even remember it or can't remember it. It's so painful that it's literally it's been compartmentalized in place. But the problem is- You can't process that you'd be capable of something like that. Yeah, and the problem is, is it's stored. Yeah. That memory, that pain or whatever, stored in the yeah. body. So you're, you're, he, you know, he'll be talking to his kids and then he'll just fly into a rage mm -hmm. and doesn't connect it to. Couldn't figure out why he was temper was the way it was or why he can't sleep at night. So crazy. Dude, super sad. Like, I mean, I was listening to Tim Kennedy uh, podcast. He was talking about like how underreported these suicides are, uh, you know, with people coming back. And it's 
to the point where it's so many that like they don't want those numbers really to they don't want to alarm everybody. You know, more more soldiers die from suicide than from war right now yeah. in the U.S. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah. so sad. Yeah, it is it's brutal. It's, it's crazy. You know, you talk about anger. You just reminded me of something else that was in the book that I thought was really fascinating. That was counterintuitive too. Is that uh, when so, when you have when you encounter somebody in sales in general and or in, in conversation, right? That is just came off of like a fight or an argument or that there is actually a lot of power in your negotiating and your ability to close them than if they were just in a normal mood. So why is that? Which is what we would is counter what we would believe. Like if you just had somebody who had a lot of like at, you know, they, at they were fighting or arguing so with that, like, so like, like bad mood. Yeah. Bad mood. Right. I don't want to walk in and try and close it, but there's actually, there's an advantage for you actually in that situation. And that's because of with using tactical empathy, knowing that they are that way, they subconsciously are actually looking for someone to be empathetic to what mm. they just went through. Mm. They want to so, kind of load on Although they're, they're very sensitive, so what you say and how you approach them is very important mm. because if you go in there and you add to that stress, mm -hmm. then it ends up blowing up your face, which is why we've always thought to, oh, avoid yeah. that situation. That's not the time to go in and try and get someone to buy or do something. Wow. But if you do a really good job of actually un listening and understanding and being empathetic to what they just went through and disarm them, mm. they then you actually have an advantage. I feel advantage. like that's where I got all my lifers that you would throw at me. Totally. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is the most difficult person, like causing a, a total scene. And then Adam would be like, hey, I got one for you over it's, here. It's true. I mean, sometimes those those people, they just want to be heard. Of course. Yeah. And, and if you can do a good job of doing that, you disarm yeah. them. And then now you have this huge actually advantage wow. in the art of persuasion in the conversation. Justin's so like, I totally understand what, you know, that you have a terrible relationship with your daughter. That's really sad. And, uh, you know, speaking of which, exercise is a really good way to solve that, which is why 20 sessions is 20. Right. Right. 20 sessions. <laughs> we'll, get right now. <laughs> we'll get you set up. It's a great deal. Dude, percent off. Dude, so uh, I wanted to talk about, you're going to be so excited right now, Adam. Oh, my God. I know. This is a topic you really love. Oh, I want to talk about. Sneakers, tennis shoes. What? I know. So, you want to talk about sneakers. I know. I don't know why. I, I don't know. I, I, Did you see Adam's shoes today? I, well, that's what, what prompted this, this right? Okay. So first life, he walks in, and those you said were the Jordan 4s. I've yeah. commented on those before, because I remember those. I remember kids wearing those in school. Yeah. Specifically, I remember the netting or whatever on the side. But or they didn't have bright yellow back then. No, it was yeah. uh, they were red, I think, mm -hmm. or black and red. Anyway, so uh, rem it rem I, I remembered something. So two things. One... I watched uh, some of the NBA finals and I never watched basketball. But one thing that I noticed, and I talked to you about it, Adam, which I thought was fascinating, was the difference in the shoes that they wear today versus oh, in I the 90s. Oh, I forgot about when you brought this oh, up. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this, this up because so we never it, talked about it on the show. No, so in the 90s, yep. when, yeah. when I was a kid and when basketball shoes were like a big thing, it was all about high tops. High mm -hmm. tops, lots of stability, pumps, you know, tighten around your ankle, whatever. I'm looking at all these guys playing basketball now and they're all like mid. Yeah. You know, there's no ankle. Free ankles. Mid or low. Yeah, or mm -hmm. low. No ankle, quote unquote ankle support. And you explained it's because they realized the well, lack I actually, of mobility. Well, I actually didn't explain it. I actually challenged you as trainers because the same thing that went through my head. So I remember this transition. And I remember like scratching my head. I was already in, in I was already training clients. So this is like, like I don't know, it was probably a decade ago when you really started to see this transition. Um and I was like, what? Why? Are they? But then it then it dawned on me. I'm like, oh, I know why. So I asked you guys, and you guys actually nailed it right away. It just, it, it's funny that it I mean, was it makes sense. We all just adopted that as the norm. Yeah. You know, as kids watching them play basketball, that, oh, yeah, high tops, for, you know, for ankle support. It was just like, we just accepted it. But after I know you guys' experience with, with training and the importance of foot strength and ankle strength and mobility in the ankle and how important that is to protecting the foot and ankle, right. I knew you guys would know. And you guys, I said, well, what do you guys think? And you both were like, well, I would think their ankle mobility and, and strength. Well, basketball is dynamic. Yeah. yeah. It's not like you're, you're deadlifting where you wear a belt and you just move. Like you're running, you're twisting, you're cutting. You want more mobility, flexibility, and of course you have to have the strength to support. Support it, but like you do that intrinsically. So the only time they will, and you still will see them occasionally now, is I should say injury? the only time. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So you roll your ankle, but you're still going to play. That makes sense. Then mm -hmm. they'll then they'll strap up. They'll put an ankle brace in there, and they'll even have like a high like a high shoe or whatever like that. So you saw Curry actually do that in the finals. He went from his lows. He, roll, he rolled his ankle. I can't remember what game it was. And then after that, he put his like. I would like to 
see this, the numbers on ankle injuries and knee injuries if they're more or less. I know. It'd be um, interesting. Oh, they, it's bro. It's the NBA. They they for sure have got the statistics on that, which is why it probably became like it overnight seemed like yeah, it went. Yeah, because they're always looking to profit, and an in, injured athlete it yeah. loses you money. Yeah. You know? so, yeah, because yeah, sure. most injuries I've seen and been a part, even my own injury, was like I didn't have that free range of motion to work with. It, it stuck. Like my foot was stuck in a fixed position, and then the rest of my body was still traveling totally. with that momentum, and then boom. Well, it's totally. Like it I, you know what I'm more, more curious about is who is responsible for influencing the NBA like that. There had to have been a very smart coach or trainer. Like who are the first ones? Yeah. yeah. Like somebody, because this is what happened. We, we, talk, we talked about this trainer. on air before. Yeah. Is like We assume that because it's the NBA, the NFL, that they have to have the best trainers and coaches, but for the, the longest time, they didn't. They're getting there. Yeah, It's definitely getting, it's way different today than it was 20 years ago. But 20 years ago, they they did not have it the was most. Just their buddy, yeah, it was yeah. somebody, somebody's yeah. uncle, cousin, nephew, or whatever like that. That's getting and they got went to school, did the pro, went through the proper chains, and it has their degree now, and so now they're qualified to be the the trainer of this team. But they, the stuff that they were implementing back then was still archaic. Well, 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 that's interesting, is you can see somebody like a PJF or PFJ. What's his yeah. PJ? Paul Fabritz. Paul Fabritz. Yeah. Uh, he. Will make more money just doing independently and not like he could easily be. He's uh, turned down. A, yeah, he's turned it he's down. He's had a bunch the opportunity to work with NBA teams and it's just, just he, he'll just makes, work with them individually, like yeah. players. Well, yes. Well, for decades, didn't basketball players wear these chucks? Low Originally, rise? Yeah, original. I mean, there's nothing. This is like about as minimal yeah. as it get. They would do that or they do the high top version of that, but yeah. Yeah, that's so. Be inter- what would be interesting, Breen, since you brought that point up, is I wonder if, if it'll keep going in that direction. Well, no, if, if the. Back then, if they had a lot of the the studies around, you know, uh, you know, t- t- uh, ankles and knee injuries, and started to compare it to, you know, say the eighties and nineties with all the high tops, yeah. and maybe they saw a huge spike and somebody pieced it together. Well, what's interesting? So, do you guys? Okay, you guys obviously remember when the whole barefoot running thing became a thing, right? And it came from yeah. uh, researchers going to other parts of the world where there are some cultures where running is a part of the culture to the point where they'll run into their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Barefoot, right? Like and they run barefoot or with almost nothing. Yeah. And what the researchers did is they were they filmed the running uh, from the side and from the front to identify if there were any differences, and there sure are. When you run barefoot naturally, not now, like if you're your, used to running in shoes now, go different. try. you try to run barefoot, you're going to hurt yourself because you're used to not doing it that way. But when you do it your whole life, you strike with your forefoot just before your heel mm-hmm. and because your ankle and your foot acts like a shock absorber. And it's actually the best shock absorber you can use. Yeah. N- today, what we do, or for a long time, is we put tons of padding and stuff on the shoe, on the heel to try and make it softer. And we actually teach ourselves to hit heel first, mm-hmm. which eliminates the shock absorbing ability and intricacies of the, f- the foot and the muscles of the foot and the ankle. So these researchers are like, this is how we're supposed to run. Now, what people did is they said, oh, let me take my shoes off and go run a bunch of miles. And they hurt themselves because you've been running for years without, you know, with shoes on. It's going to take you a long time to learn the other way. So it is really interesting. I wonder if it's going to go in that direction. It's weird because it's sort of like, I mean, you've seen how conditioned athletes have gotten over the years just because of the shoes that they grew up with and and how they have the elevated heel support already. And they've always been used to that. And so it's like... You know, they don't even know how to like strike with their forefoot or like be on their forefoot. I had like have to teach this to death to a lot of these uh, athletes on how to like be more active and mobile and be ready, be in a ready position. Uh, because you know, being on your heels, you're, you're dead, you're dead in the water, you're gonna on the get field. Flattened. Yeah, you're gonna get pushed over. So, you know, having to deliberately like teach that to me is like mind blowing. Yeah, you I, know, it's you just, you know, what else I thought of? So, in the 90s, there was this trend of like shoe technology, I put in quotations, it was all about selling the shoe based off of the newest air or gas or whatever in there to make you jump higher. And then I remembered, and I had it wrong when I told you guys, it was Carl Malone's LA Gear Catapult. That was the shoe. <laughs> Do you, wow, remember, you remember that? Do you remember Catapult? You were I so close. You, shoe, did a Patrick Ewing, yeah. you did a Patrick Ewing reference and uh, said, wow. That's, no, it was Carl Malone. Yeah, you like BK Knights. It was LA Gear Catapult. And the commercial, wow. I remember this as a kid because it closed me as a kid. Dude, I watched LA the commercial. Was the worst. It shows like the foot hitting the ground and there's a catapult in there that it had like, like, forward. like 
afraid. Do you know that has like, to be one of the biggest flops on one of the biggest names in, in yes, sports yes. for a shoe? Like, it was. Was it? Yes, it was. I, 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 I know but it. But I bet, you, the wor- awful, I bet you now, if you have a pair now that are like yeah. in good condition, it'd be dude, novelty. A shit oh, man. Yeah. There's got to be somebody out there that wants those. I, I bet you. Oh, that's I a funny. That's Isn't a, that interesting? That is really. You know, uh, I know this is like total anecdotal because it's my son and I only have one. But I swear to God, the the time that I put him, keeping him barefoot for so long, I, he didn't go through that that typical toddler falling over phase that yeah. like every kid goes through. And I swear I attribute it to his his foot strength and stability yeah. of keeping him barefoot. We, like so he, we keep Aurelius, try to keep him barefoot uh, as as long as often as appropriately possible. Meaning, obviously, if we're outside and it looks like oh, the ground might be a little whatever, we'll put shoes on. But usually we keep him barefoot. He's way better balanced barefoot. Wait, because he's mostly barefoot. You yeah. put his shoes on him, and you can see, you can see he's trying to feel the ground. And- yeah, I know that. So he, Max is the only time Max has scuffed his knees has been when he's wearing shoes and he's going to run, and you can see that he still hasn't adapted to the shoes. Yeah. And I was explaining that to family, and they're like, "Well, see, now what, he's going to fall the rest of his life or something." I said, "No, <laughs> yeah. Eventually, he will get really good at walking in shoes. But I care more that he has foot strength yeah, and ankle mobility." Here. And, and that ability to control himself. He can articulate his toes. Yes. And he can balance. And he, on you'll his see him. Feet. Like, he'll, yeah. he's, it's wild, bro. He'll be sitting down and he always is comfortable in that deep squatted position. Yeah. That's how he plays and reads and sits. And he'll, you can see he'll naturally does this with his toes while he's doing that's something. That's so that's great. Cool. I know. So, I mean, I, of course, I have one kid. And so I know it's not. No, it. no, that's legit. I got an argument with, my old, with some older relatives because they told me, aren't you going to get supportive shoes for Aurelius? Like, cause, cause their idea was back in the day, you get stiff, yeah. supportive shoes with a little heel. Cause then your kids can walk sooner. I'm like, no, I don't want that. And I'm trying to explain to them. We get in this big old debate yeah. and I finally, I'm just like, yeah, yeah okay. It's a crutch, dude. And I just stopped the conversation, but it, that's exactly, that was, that was the, the thought process. Yeah. So no wonder we wake up, we, you know, get older and we have all these weird foot issues. Well, speaking of training, I've, I've been getting a lot of emails lately, actually from parents, which is pretty cool. Um, from the football from team, the football team. And also from just, you know, doing that podcast with DeFranco, um, that, um, cause we talked a little bit about nutrition, but, uh, you know, a lot about training, but mainly just like that difficulty of, of getting enough protein and adequate protein to these athletes. And, uh, and I told I told my story on the show a bunch of times about how I was like rewarding these kids with like magic spoon and you know just for somebody like me you know growing up that would have been a game changer because it was too. just like oh, morning geez. or even at night I'd be shoveling that in anyways right I'd be eating a huge bowl of cereal and it's like to have an option of like loading them up with more protein because the thing is too it was my household was with two boys and just to keep up with the meat demands for two boys, <laughs> dude, that gets expensive yeah. like, really fast. And so, you know, between that and like, yeah, I had a couple, even like butcher box. They're like, Oh, thank you. Cause they just need help with, uh, you know, being able to, to supply them with yeah. enough of this, uh, for, for their training. If I had magic spoon as a kid, are you kidding me right now? I could have a bowl of 30 grams of protein, uh, in a bowl of cereal. I was doing it anyway. I was, except I was eating, Sugar Smacks, Pops, and Lucky Charms. Yeah. Which is not. <laughs> not or, even or pouring like yeah, a all the sugar I, I even did this. I did like Cheerios that. and I take a scoop of whey protein and put it in. It was so, did you do that? Oh, I did stuff like that. It was so disgusting. When I got into lifting weights, the things that I would do to get protein, because yeah. I was out now, I was not your typical 15 year old kid. I was like you know, obsessed. I would make <laughs> chicken breast, tuna fish shakes. Shakes oh, God. in so, a blender. That's so gross. <laughs> got to get it down. That's so gross. Yeah, you should have seen my mom was like, she got in a big old fight with me once. I had to hide <laughs> and do it. No one's around. <laughs> Drink it real quick. Did oh. you make one of those? Sh- no, mom. I didn't do that. I mean, we talk about like, it, obviously it's a processed food, right? And we always talk about like the the idea of getting whole foods. And so sometimes I think people get the wrong message when we talk about that. No, you got to work food. with what you got to work with. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're an adult and you're responsible, you're making all your meals and stuff like that, like 100% I'm going to push my clients no. always to you- whole natural food you right? have to consider always first of all don't make you know, teenagers come on this don't is a different story. i said this last time i was like well, don't what is it don't make good the enemy of perfect right so uh you don't do this all perfect, the time. perfect the enemy of perfect good. the enemy of good okay i said it backwards again um th- that's a very important thing to do because there's ideal and then there's okay what do we actually deal with so i'll give you guys a great example organic is another example we yes. talk about this all the time about the i mean there's a hierarchy yeah organic like- is down here at the top is calories then macros then food quality, okay? That's the hierarchy. So if you're about food quality, but you don't care, pay attention to the other stuff, 
Uh, although food quality contributes to those, and it's more complex than the way I'm making it sound right now. But if you eat too much, even if the food quality is great, which can happen, it doesn't matter. Your, your health is well. Yeah, it's like it's like uh, you know eating all organic and grass fed meats, and but yet uh, drinking a liter of Pepsi every single day. Yeah, it's like, and being over calories by or drinking know. a liter of organic Pepsi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. that's like the, other, the, the organic say. candy always cracks me up. That's I eat that. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I do that? Hey, it's subconscious. It I makes you know that. You know, like, no, you know why I do it? <laughs> I swear to God, this is why I do it. Because I know it's bullshit, but the reason why I do it is I want to give my money to companies that are going in that direction anyway. Oh, so that's funny. And you're right. It makes me feel a little better. Yeah, they, and they know that. Yeah. So that's why so, they do that. So, <laughs> yeah. they, know, they, they know that. We'll make this for sale. gummy bears. So, so speaking of which, about you know, perfect the enemy of good and whatever, uh, government's great at this. Government's great at passing laws that feel good and never considering the potential unintended consequences. So here's one of the dumbest things that is coming out now. So- they are pushing a policy right now, and I would love you guys' feedback, what you think could potentially happen from this. They are pushing a policy right now to mandate that cigarettes have low amounts of nicotine. So they're going to they're gonna give them a cap and make it very low that cigarettes will now have way less nicotine because, of course, nicotine is the pleasurable part of cigarettes. It's also the part that, that you know, we know what will make it addictive. And so they're like, hey, here's the deal. We're going to help people not smoke because it's bad for you. We're going to pass a law. All cigarettes need to be low nicotine. Any, so, any thoughts so on, of course, on what's going to happen? Like, yeah, we're going to, now we're going to have a, a, a bigger black market yeah, black just, like we, just like we do in yeah. cannabis. It's a reason why the cannabis laws and rules are stupid. And the whole idea that we have all these cannabis clubs is, oh, we're moving in this direction. Yeah, but then we tax the shit out of it. We put the prices through the roof. And so it still drives a black market because people are going yeah. to, it feels same good concept. to do that, but what's going to happen as a result of that? That's what you always not, have to think. Not to mention, you're not addressing the issue. The, the, the issue is not like the amount of nicotine in cigarettes that's the problem. That's not the root cause of what causes these people to keep it's the they've got something else that they're escaping from or they want and yeah. you we'll find another product. You manipulating that is not going to and and here's the shitty part. Let me talk about politics. What will happen is they'll show the decrease in, in purchases because now people aren't going the legal route, but then they're doing it on the black market, which they can't track, and so they're going to probably make well, the case for it's working. Let me let me <laughs> yeah, re let me rephrase this because there's another thing that I think you guys uh, that that's going to be more obvious. Okay, imagine and by the way, I do want to say this: nicotine is not harmful. Yes, it's addictive, like caffeine is, but it's actually not harmful. It's all the other shit in cigarettes. Uh, all yeah. the smoke and the is other stuff. Is that naturally uh, produced when you condense down uh, tobacco leaves? Yeah, tobacco yeah, contains Yeah, like it contains. contains it. Yeah, so let me let me rephrase this and let me see what you guys, because you guys like cough, coffee a lot. You love coffee. Fuck yeah. Okay, now let's say the typical cup of coffee has got 100 milligrams of caffeine. I was using an arbitrary number. And the government says, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to mandate that a cup of coffee can have no more than 20 milligrams mm. of caffeine. I just drink double now. There you no, go. No, five cups. You'll yeah, have yeah. five cups. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. do you think people are going to do with cigarettes now? Buy more cigarettes. Yeah. They're hey, going to smoke how, way more cigarettes. Hey, how gangster <laughs> would this be if Philip Morris is like behind the scenes of lobbying for this to happen? That would be the biggest. Oh, so they could sell more cigarettes? Yes. I wouldn't be surprised. How gangster would that be if it was Philip Morris' idea for the government to push something like that? Didn't they show that like they that? funded um, the uh, the campaigns for the anti yes. tobacco Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Campaigns? Because they, because it have you ever seen that movie? It's a good, good show. Thank Th you for smoking. Thank you for smoking. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They talk yeah. about that. The, and, and I would not be surprised... If it was a lobbyist, lobbyist from that represents the Philip Morris that got the government to go in that direction to make everybody think that we're actually trying to help people, when in reality well, we know it's only going to double our cigarette well, sales. Well, what's going to happen is <laughs> I, I know my manipulation. Yeah, I know this for a fact. People are going to smoke more cigarettes. Oh, this one only gave me so much. I only felt this much. Let me smoke another two. Now you've got three or four times the carcinogens and the nicotine, which didn't hurt you. Yes, it's the addictive thing, but it didn't hurt you physically or cause cancer. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the part that we're regulating. It's wow. ridiculous. Absolutely wow. ridiculous. And then the black market, absolutely. There's already black markets for cigarettes in states yeah. that where they're like, highly taxed. Is it still like that? I know New York New York used yeah. to be like that. Is it still like that? Yeah, you go that's wow. remember that one guy, what was his name? That 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 gentleman that he ended up getting taken down by police for selling loose cigarettes. And oh yeah. Ended yeah, up yeah, suffocating yeah. Uh, as a result for selling loose cigarettes. Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah absolutely ridiculous. So stupid policies, it's not gonna result. And, and then here's the other thing. Because it's a nicotine regulation, here's why I think what you said might be absolutely correct with Philip Morris. Because it's a nicotine regulation, you know who's going to get hit hard from this? Vape companies and Juul, yeah. which cigarette companies, it's direct competition. Ooh, yeah, they may be trying to eliminate 
their competition. Correct. Interesting. So that now you hammer the shit out of them, right. you're gone, and then you smoke more cigarettes, and we're still here. And you're all good. Are we wearing tinfoil hats or are we like right on the mark? Here, I dude? think we're right on the mark. I kind of feel like we're on the mark with yeah. this one. We're 100% <laughs> on the mark. It's just, it's just money. Yeah, yeah dude. Yeah. We'll see just, if it passes. Yeah. Follow the money. Yeah, yeah. That's it's fun. like, yeah, I know. It's so ridiculous. It's like when they passed the, remember that? Uh, my favorite one is when Congress passed like the, I don't remember what it was called, but it was to make school lunches healthier. Oh, yeah, then the pizza? Because the pizza counts as the sauce. The sauce counts, counts as the vegetable. vegetable. <laughs> yes. Uh, They're like, it has to have a vegetable. And then the, the freaking the the you know the pizza you know lobby or whoever yeah. lobbies it. well tomato sauce you know tomato people wonder why we're skeptical yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. they wonder I know yeah it's we it. got our pizza it's got yeah. some vegetables in it yeah. I know it's ridiculous how anyway. are gas prices over at your place right now are you are you uh, seeing an increase still I think it's it, I like, peaked at seven seven yeah it's like seven I did you see that the the prophecy fulfilled itself seven eleven is now selling gas for seven <laughs> eleven oh my god seven dollars so eleven cents funny. I did not see that meme yeah. that's hilarious I mean it's pretty much up there uh, for premium you know you're you're getting that like seven eleven seven twelve was it's it Andrew that was telling us crazy. the uh, the the clip from um what's the Will Smith one where the everything they like the apocalypse happens and everything like that what's oh uh, uh, oh yeah I am legend I yeah am legend. I am was it Andrew that was telling us that the, the gas prices in there are the were, ones that we have now? No, or lower. Oh. Was, so even when the, the apocalypse happened, Damn. they thought they zombie predict, apocalypse. We just bypassed the apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, that's what we did. What the, what the hell are you? No, no, no. Keep her uh, gas, yeah. everybody. Oh man. Yeah, hey, speaking of it. speaking of cool, I don't know, conspiracy ish stuff. Do you know what they're studying a lot right now for its effects, positive effects on COVID? Cannabinoids, Dude. cannabinoids, the things that wins again. What is, what is cannabis <laughs> not good for? I know. Been trying to say this for Dude, a long so time. So CBD in particular, and other cannabinoids, CBD and other cannabinoids in particular, are being shown in animal studies to prevent the the COVID uh, virus from getting into your cells. So mm. not just like not just like oh, it helps with the inflammation stuff like which I'll get to, but actually potentially preventing you from catching it. In the first place. These are animal what? studies, of course, so take it with a grain of salt. Wow. But very fascinating. And then THC, they did in a mouse study, and it prevented the cytokine storm that causes death. So the, all the animals in the THC study, none of them died from COVID, whereas the ones that were the controls, you saw a few of them die. So is it like the same mechanism? Like You know how you take zinc and it kind of replaces a molecule, so it kind of blocks it? Is that... Uh, oh, um, not quite. I think s not not like that, but but something a little different. I think CBD has to do with the God. Now I can't remember. There's a receptor, alpha receptor. I can't remember the name of it in the cells that that allow you to uptake it. And children have less of it, which is why they get mm. a lower response. But apparently, it it helps block that or prevent the COVID uh, vi virus from attaching and replicating or whatever. And then uh, all the cannabinoids have this kind of systemically anti-inflammatory effect right. that's, or inflammatory regulating effect. Which we knew that, yeah. Yes. But, so, that, so, so that's a study that just came out or? There's, there's a lot There's a lot now that are coming. So if you Google like CBD in, in COVID or THC in COVID, you'll pull up all these different studies that show this. Now, uh, obviously, uh, this is going to lead to one of our sponsors, Ned, not saying take Ned for COVID, but uh, what you do see with Ned or with cannabinoids is this long kind of uh, you know, well-regulated inflammatory response. That's what you tend to see with people. So when people use it, and that's the messages I get, and that's what I notice too, Yeah, is that people just generally feel uh, a more appropriate levels of inflammation. I say appropriate because you could take a strong anti-inflammatory like Advil or ibuprofen, which tampers down inflammation, but it does it indiscriminately, meaning that you lose some of the potential benefits of inflammation because it's a signaling you know, process. But cannabinoids don't seem to do that. So it regulates inflammation like a light dimmer switch on your light dimmers, uh, on your light switch, allowing your body to have appropriate levels of inflammation. It, it seems to have a positive impact in, on like every part of your body. That's why it's, I feel like it's why it's so popular right now. And because we didn't have a lot of research and studies around it, and now all of that's coming. Yeah. So it, se it almost feels like every. Well, it kind of works with a lot of different. That's things, what I mean. Right? There's like, adaptogen. It's like it kind of helps. To, what do you call that? A thermostat or not a thermostat? Like a a dimmer switch. Yeah, like it just helps to kind of uh, mitigate like the highs and then the lows. It's an immun immunomodulator. So what they find in, in studies is people with autoimmune issues have a good response. So hyperimmune system, and then they show in studies with people with a low immune response, people with like HIV and cancer, you get a, a boost of immune function. Speaking of which, did you know the first 
study on cannabis that showed uh, anti-cancer effects. Because there's lots of them now that show anti-cancer effects. But the first one that was that showed that potentially showed that was a government funded study, and I think it was, was in the seventies, right? Nineteen seventy four, I want to yeah. say, and and the government funded a study to show. Do they keep it classified? Well, here's what they did. This is true. It's not a conspiracy. They wanted to show that oh, for sure, marijuana causes lung cancer. Oh, yeah, I remember. As the study was progressing, <laughs> yeah. there was a per slight protective effect. They yeah. shut it down, classified it. Nobody can find out about Done. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Yeah. This doesn't help our uh, initiative. You yeah. know, isn't that a good time? Yeah. Anyway, hey, so I was uh, online on YouTube again because you, know, you guys know I'm I'm home alone right now, so I have all this time to watch weird shit. Uh, I know. Uh, I watched. Uh, you guys ever watch Brock Lesnar? In college, when he wrestled, he was a beast. Bro. You want to talk about? He was like just as big. Uh, he was like if this was ten thousand years ago, he would be the guy on the horse. Yeah, yeah. You, the, you said him. with the horn helmet, yeah. just bro killing he, people. His forehead would knock people out, dude. Just, you know. he was a in college a monster. Yeah, I watched his championship match. We'll put it in the in the show notes, or we'll put it up here. He was so jacked. And crazy strong looking. I can't even believe that he, humans he's like that Viking exist. DNA for sure. Well, I, I remember the, watching his first fights in the UFC and him not having any real mixed martial arts skills at all, but still winning fights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, just it just highlights like what a beast he is because you're talking about Ooh, trained Mir, professionals in him? MMA. Yeah, and you know he is one of those. He's that exception to the rule where you talk about like, oh, you know. Weight doesn't matter if you have someone who's extremely skilled and this like that. Like, there's a point. Where well, he was a collegiate wrestler, but he didn't have uh, you're right, no MMA skill. Oh yeah, no. And what was that match? He like held someone down. And he just pinned them basically. Yeah, and just kept being hammer up. fisting them to death, <laughs> and they yeah. just couldn't yeah. do anything he just about. Ground it. and pounded them until they submitted. Just know? a yeah. monster. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you meet someone like that in person, you don't expect them to move like that either because he's right. so big. Yeah, he's fast. Dude. Did yeah, he you play know all the moves? Too? I don't know. Did I he thought play he played college football or almost uh, made it pro too. I thought. Yeah, I don't know about football. I definitely know he was like national champion wrestler at uh, Minnesota. So, well, how old are you when you're? He's got to. He had to be like twenty one, like twenty one years old, right? Twenty two when, when he was in college and he uh, and, and he wrestled. Uh, oh yeah, in his tw in early twenties at the yeah, at the yeah, latest. Yeah, yeah. You imagine being a twenty one year old that looked like that? Yeah. You'd be like, okay, <laughs> wonder what his parents look like. I don't know. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, but it's always some anomaly where there's like the parents are like five three and like one hundred eighty five, and they had that. You know what I'm saying? Like, what they, the fuck? Like, they were, they were pulling up to see if he played football again. Played for the Vikings. Yes, he played wow. professional football. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was. he's just a super athlete, bro. Yeah. Uh, just a superhuman. Just a phenom. Insane. That just goes to show you the, the wide spectrum of genetics that existed in humans, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he actually made the team. He though. didn't make the team. Yeah, he, he wasn't like a main player with that. But I mean, the fact that you even try out for a professional team means yeah. you could play, speaking you could of, play football. Speaking of uh, yeah. like ridiculous athletes, I also watched highlight videos of Bo Jackson. That guy was insane. Oh well, now you're talking. He was the first. To, he was the first to the go both ways, athlete. right? Yeah, football and baseball. I'd argue the best athlete of all time. I would agree. Have you ever general. watched his documentary on like how his he's his personality is and like no. he's oh dude he's so like chill and really not, yeah yeah there's a really good thirty for thirty on him if you've never had a chance I'd to watch since you're watching it's random awesome. shit. <laughs> And now that you are bringing that up, you should go down the rabbit hole and watch his 30 for 30. Like, was, it, was that the one where they should, like, when he grew up and kids threw rocks at him and he'd, like, run away? And, I think so. Yeah. I think that's in there. But you, just, he, you, you do not anticipate his personality to be the way it is based off of, like, what a, what a superior athlete You know what's crazy was. about that? I, I would it was like he is so gifted and he really didn't try that hard. You know, it's yeah. I, I wonder if either, in many though. of these situations, if you grew up with someone like this, everybody just knew right because he must have stood out like he stood out in professional sports. oh 100 percent. he must have been in high school it must Dude, have been a joke. the ones that make it to the elite level you see it real young i i have a i have on katrina's side she has a nephew um that and i only i only get to see him every once in a while and i remember seeing him when he was like i want to say he was seven or nine he was under 10 and he was throwing and he's now in like a traveling baseball team like he's really really good and i remember seeing him like seven or nine years old throw to my other nephew who was in high school playing high school baseball at that time mm -hmm. they were playing this game that baseball players play where you stand across from each other and if you throw it as hard as fast as you can right at their face it's like three points and then i forget how the point system works and you play mm -hmm. it i forget the, i'm sure some baseball player will tell me the name of the game i forget what it's called so it's 21 yeah so 21 right and that's it's three points when you hit straight on right 
Okay. Oh, okay. So and 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 you were supposed to be whipping it at each other as hard as you can. And this little kid is like, I mean, he was whooping my my other nephew, the older one's ass at just how pinpoint accurate and fast and hard. And you could just see it. Yeah. He's throwing and moving like a like a collegiate level adult at nine years old, dude. Oh, yeah. Insane. You just know. And then of course I've watched him over the last ten years progress in the game but you can see it like at bro a there's this kid named danny mix uh when we were in like little league who's left-handed pitcher i thought for sure he's gonna be the next randy johnson like he was probably throwing like 70 miles an hour uh but you know how close yeah. you are <laughs> you know at that level like the mound is really close so it literally felt like 90 to 100 mile an hour ball coming at you and he would brush everybody back and everybody was just terrified he struck everybody out He's nobody hit him you ever yeah. seen a, a top level uh i thought something that surprised me i saw a college i actually trained a, call, a D1 uh, softball player, so a girl, right? And I always thought softball, I know they throw it fast, but how fast could you possibly throw it? Dude, I saw her pitch that thing. I'm like, that's a big ass ball going real fast. Oh, that yeah. was pretty remarkable. Well, they've they've compared like because the the like Justin's talking about the mound length is a difference, it makes a huge difference. There's more time to when you're in professional. So when you see 103 miles an hour and you compare it to like a little league doing 77 yeah. or a softball at let's say 60 or something like that, like they're comparable. I don't know what the exact calculations are, but it's not fair to compare a yeah. 60 mile an hour softball. Same as a softball pitch, yeah. So that's they, they, yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. You can't compare the two. Now it's they not, say that pitching softball uh, that the way that they do it underhand is much easier on the body, mm. and it's supposed to be biomechanically it's supposed to be better for the shoulder. Is right? that what they say? Yeah, I mean that's what they purport, but I. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I've, I I don't know what the long term effects of. Like, I would imagine the bicep and the bicep tendon would looks be, like a lot of force. I mean, they definitely generate a ton of force by doing yeah. that. You know, you could see talent like this in other areas too. So my uh, my brother in law, he has a little girl. She's the most charismatic little kid I've ever I swear, I've ever met. She's a little kid, and she makes videos on his phone. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like. If don't let her get on YouTube yeah. because she'll get famous right away. You can see it early. She's young. She's a little like I don't know how old is she. She's got to be uh, six maybe. And she's like, "Hey, welcome to my channel. All right, today here's what we're making." And I'm looking at this. I'm like, "Dude, your daughter's mm. super charismatic, bro. Yeah. You better keep your keep your eyes on her. You know, yeah. crazy. Foster it. All right, check this out. High quality ingredients, convenience, great tasting, superfood blends that make it easy for you to get nutrients. Uh, organic powders like protein powders that are plant-based, uh, powders like gold juice, which helps you relax at night, green juice for health, red juice for energy. What am I talking about? Organifi, one of the best companies we've ever worked with. This is an organic supplement company that makes products for health, wellness, and athletic performance. You got to go check them out and you can get 20% off if you go through our link. Head over to Organifi.com forward slash mind pump, use the code mind pump and get 20% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Philip from Tennessee. Philip, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, what's going on, man? So, uh, <clears throat> a little bit of background. I'm 36, six foot tall, weigh about 185. Uh, pretty muscular, other than the, the lower belly fat and love handles. Hard to get rid of that stuff. That's what I'm trying to do, get rid of that. Uh, my main goal is to build muscle, burn fat, be as lean as possible. I'm eating super clean. Uh, I follow your guy's friend, Max Lugabeer. I follow all of his nutrition advice. I read Genius Foods a couple months ago. It changed my life. Then I started listening to his podcast. I came across a couple of episodes with Sal as the guest and got turned on to Mind Pump. Uh, after listening to y'all and hearing about full body workouts, I started doing that. So now I train weight with weights three days a week, doing total body workouts. I do jujitsu three days a week. My day off, I stay active. I walk for about a half an hour. Um, every day I do 20 push-ups every two hours. That's seven days a week. So what I've been doing, uh, as far as nutrition wise, I've been intermittent fasting, uh, with the fasting lasting for 20 hours, a four hour feeding window, eating two meals a day. All of my foods are very nutrient dense. I pretty much, I eat all the, all the uh, genius foods. Uh, my question is, does my body absorb and use all of the nutrients the same way in those four hours, eating only twice as it would if I were to eat three to four meals a day over, say, you know, an eight eight to ten hour window, as opposed to what I'm it doing. does. But that's not what I'm concerned about. Yeah, generally it does, but um, more frequent protein feedings may have some benefit. But I know where Adam's going. I think you're you're doing way too much. Yeah, 
for yeah. how little you're feeding too. Yeah, you, you you throw in everything but the kitchen sink at yourself. Uh, so fasting can cause additional stress on the body in the right context. Then you're doing jujitsu, which I did jujitsu for a long time. I know how strenuous and, and challenging that is. So you're doing that three days a week, plus you're lifting three days a week, plus you're doing push-ups every two hours, every couple hours. Way too much, way too much on your body. So however you're progressing now, or maybe you've plateaued, you could be progressing a lot faster if you scaled things back. So let me ask you a question. What's more important to you, the strength training or the jujitsu? Because I'm going to give you some recommendations, but I want to make sure it's based on what you want to do. Uh, the strength training. Okay. So I would go two days a week of strength training and one or two days a week of jujitsu. Okay. Not three days and three. That's way too much. So two days of strength, one or two days of jujitsu. So bring that down. So now you're working out four days a week. Push-ups every other hour. You know, I would say if the intensity is really low, that's fine. In other words, if you can pump out 20 reps and it's like a piece of cake, there's nothing wrong with that. But if it feels like you're working out way too much, so I have no problem with every couple hours you're doing some kind of movement, but it's got to be really easy. Feel like you could do it with your eyes closed type of intensity. So that'll just facilitate recovery. Otherwise, way too much working out. Fasting. Nothing necessarily wrong with that so long as you're getting the, the right amount of nutrients and so long as you're not exhibiting any signs of stress from that much fasting. So what does that look like? It looks like your energy starts to dip, you get really fatigued, your hot, cold tolerance starts to change, you find yourself colder than normal, or when you go out in the sun, it seems more unbearable uh, than it normally would. If you're noticing those things, then what I would do is I would have, make sure you eat a higher fat, higher protein breakfast, um, and then eat a couple more meals. I mean, uh, we worked with Dr. Cabral recently, um, who's a great functional medicine practitioner. He recommended that Justin start eating breakfast specifically because mm -hmm. of some of the stuff that he noticed. And uh, I mean, I'll let Justin tell you his experience with that, but he's he, he told me it's been a game oh, it's changer. been a game changer. Yeah, because of being for this is a couple of years of, of skipping breakfast. So it's not like something I just did for a while and then stopped. This is became a, a behavioral habit of mine, uh, which, you know, definitely affected my stress levels. And then also to, um, you know, that carried into the workout. So, uh, what you don't think might be a stressor that is is then adding to your bucket of stress, you have to kind of account and have inventory of all these things and, and whether or not your your recovery then uh, is is adequate enough in terms of like, now I, ha I need to figure out how to, to raise up my recovery. Uh, and a lot of times what that means is I have to either reduce all these crazy strenuous activities or I have to then, you know, refuel my body and give it the nutrients and things that I need. Um, you know, as I first wake up, it was like, it was a big deal for me in terms of like, you know, having that type of, of energy and, and, um, fuel for me first thing in the morning. Philip, have you actually wrote down and tracked, uh, what you're consuming? You have a four hour eating window, so you're only eating once or twice. Have you actually tracked the, your calories, proteins, fats? Have you tracked that to see what you're doing consistently? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I, down to the macros <clears throat> every single day. Pretty much eat the same thing every single day. So um, about sixteen hundred, not not much either. Uh, sixteen hundred and fifty calories. Yeah. I'm trying to cut down. Yeah, uh, I want I want to build muscle, but like I said, burn fat too. There's a jujitsu competition in November. Uh, I'm sure uh, y'all might know. I don't know. You know, I'm trying to get down to one seventy five and be around being that. That so way, class. So you're you're definitely making it harder for yourself. I promise you that. You could actually do a lot less uh, work and stress on your body and get there a lot a lot easier than what you're doing right now. So if you're only eating 1,600 calories, I'm assuming you're probably under eating 180 grams of protein every day too. Uh, 165. Okay, so that's not bad. So if you're at least hitting the protein there, but that low of calories, that much work you're doing. It yeah, six foot tall, 185, 1,600 calories with all that work. Your your body is in. It, you're really teaching your body to to store. Your your body's trying to be as efficient as possible because mm -hmm. you're not feeding it much for a guy your size, plus all that activity. So I would do what I said with the workout. By the way, if you have a competition in jujitsu, you can flip what I said. You could do three days a week of jujitsu, one day a week of strength training. Uh, if you want to really do well in the jujitsu competition, that'll serve you better. Uh, but I would increase your your food intake, and I would do it by eating breakfast. You know, throw a three hundred calorie breakfast uh, in the morning, a fat and protein breakfast. It will kind of keep your blood sugar stabilized, give you some more, you know, a little bit more calories, and go from there. But right now, you got nowhere to go. You want to get leaner? What are you going to do? Cut your calories more? Work out even more? You're screwed, right? So 
we got to back you out of that a little bit and get things speeding up. And I'm telling you, 1,600 calories for a guy your size with that much activity. Oh, hell, that's way That's low. really low, right? You should be, I mean, if you were, if everything was working the way that I would want it, a guy your size doing six days a week of exercise, three 26, days a week. 26, 2,800 yeah. calories. Yeah, you'd be close to 3,000 calories, right? So, so, so consider that. So start scaling it back, bump up your calories, eat a breakfast. A high fat, high protein breakfast will set your set you up. You'll feel good. You'll have good energy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the workout, you could either do, like I said, two days a week of strength training and one or two days a week of jujitsu. Or if you want to win this competition, I'd flip it, go three days of jujitsu, one day of strength training, and do a full body workout. How long do we have till the competition? So the competition's in November, and it's more of a. I mean, I'm into it, but it's more of a fun thing with my brothers. I'm taking it seriously, but I'm more serious about getting my body right well that, okay. so that's good news because that's plenty of time to reverse you out since i i didn't know if it was like four weeks away or something because i was like oh shit four that's weeks away you got to get down to 175 i don't know what we're no, telling remember we're good yeah no we got plenty of time so what you should do right now is don't don't be hung up so much on the scale start to increase the calories like sal is saying scale back the amount of volume that you're training and and let your body recover a little bit let your metabolism recover a little bit and and build that up I'd really like you to be in a place of eventually, not right away, but north of 2,400 calories before I start to cut you for the, the jiu-jitsu thing. And by the way, that would be the goal. The goal that you and I would have is, okay, let's try and gain as little on the scale as possible. So I want you to hover around 185, 190. I don't want you to go much higher than that. Let's slowly try and increase calories week over week in, in increments of about 200 calories or so. Focus on getting strong. And just kind of keep the and get those calories to where hopefully coming into end of October, I've got you at about twenty four hundred plus calories, and then I can restrict calories for the final couple of weeks heading into your jujitsu tournament, and you'll lean right out. Yeah, but and, and you know we'll notice right away, Philip, by doing this, is you're just going to see yourself get stronger in the gym. That's the first thing you're going to if you do this within a, within a week or two, you'll notice your the mm -hmm. weights go up. You'll start to feel a lot stronger. That's a good sign. So pay attention to that. Okay. Now, let me ask you. So my schedule, Monday through Friday, I, I work out at 4 a.m. I got to be up at 3. Should I, so eat breakfast in that in that hour before I work out? No, afterwards. Yeah, right you, after. you're afterwards. Just, afterwards, okay. Yeah, by the yeah, way, no, you're no. just adding more to this stress bucket. By the, the more the more story you tell <laughs> here. Do you also work like fucking 16 <laughs> hour days too? Is that next? Or what, what time do you have? Do you have nine I kids? I go to sleep at like 8 o'clock. Do you night. have Do you have nine kids too? What else you got going on, bro? We need to find, <laughs> you got a lot on your right, plate, dude. You got a lot. I know it, man. It's a lot. It's a lot. What do you? No, you said you got. You said you go to bed at 8 o'clock every night. Yeah, I crashed. Man, I'm, I'm laying down about 7.45. I'll reach. Okay, that's good. Or so. Okay, okay, that's good. No, 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 that's yeah, good. That's yeah. good. You're doing that right. <laughs> yeah, all right, man. Well, good. Well, well, yeah, do what we said. I think you'll be totally fine. Your body's going to respond really, really well. You know, why don't we throw you in the forum, Phil? Are you in our private forum yet? So that, is that that's social media, right? Yeah. Are you not on social media? I'm not on any social media, man. Oh, yeah, I like this guy. You know? hey, it's, yeah. hey, the, it's, it's the healthiest move. thing you're doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good for you, man. Well, at least at least there's that. Yeah, Avoid yeah. the drama. It's good. It's good well, for you. Well, make sure you check back in with us while, while you're doing that. What do we have? Are you, oh, he's on Anabolic right now? Are yeah. you following Maps Anabolic? What's your program? No, so that's what I was. That's what I was. I, was, I haven't got a Maps program yet. Um, I've been listening to you guys probably a month and a half. And I just went. I've been going off what you what y'all been saying. I haven't. I'm not following the program. All okay. right, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you maps anabolic. Yeah, send you that, maps. Yeah, anabolic. That's your program. Okay, and dude, I, I saw. I, I actually it's on my screen right now. It says two to three gym sessions per week. So, so do the two. Do yeah. the two, and then the two jujitsu. Two to three jujitsu, and then you'll be set. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and then the trigger sessions. You're kind of doing that. Yeah, you're, you kind of doing that with your. You're kind of doing that with your push ups, but you can replace the push ups with trigger sessions, and the program will explain Throw it. Throw some to you. bands in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got some bands. Good deal. Yeah, follow, follow that. Increase those calories. Bump those calories up a couple hundred, and let's see. Uh, see, and, and focus on it's getting. It's gonna make strong. a world of difference, dude. Yeah. So a couple hundred per week or so. Yeah. So or a couple hundred. So like right now, what do we say? You're at sixteen hundred. So right away, sixteen hundred and fifty. Okay. And I just got done eating. I'm done like for the day. I mean, so yeah, get, get your ass up to at least 1850, 1900 right now. Yeah. So like a nice, a nice scramble in the morning, you know, you got your, you, that'll give you the, the extra 200 to, th to 300 calories right out the okay. gates. Yeah. Okay. So, so bump that up, run that for at least a week or two. 
you know, see how you feel. So long as we don't see a, a major jump on the scale, the next week, throw in another another 200 after that. So follow that for at least a week or two. Really pay attention to how you feel energy-wise, strength. Make sure you're not seeing like a dramatic swing on the scale. So long as you don't see yourself shoot up beyond five pounds on the scale, I'd increase you again another 200 calories on top of that. So within a, within a, within a month, we're up to like 2,200 or so calories, hopefully. Okay. Cool. Sounds good. I appreciate you guys for real, man. Right on. Right. Daily. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank appreciate you, man. the support, Philip. Thanks, guys. It's uh, as he was going. I'm, I was like, you know, I, I'm I, I wake up at this time. Yeah. I do push ups every Put other hour. The tally I do this. Up. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's all kinds of stuff. That's, you, know, you're adding up. you know, this really what this really points to is the will that some people have, yeah. and, and it's and they will ignore the signs yeah. that they're overdoing it because they're so determined. And right. you could tell by the way he's talking, like he is doing everything mm -hmm. that he has learned so far because he's right. excited about it, and you know, he, he's seen some weight loss, right? Uh, but man, you, you're he's doing a lot of work, but it's not necessarily benefiting him. No, you got to be effective. You want to be effective. You don't want to just spin your tires in the in the in the dirt because you're not going anywhere. And then eventually, you set yourself up for a really really tough time to maintain. And, and, and oftentimes, people fail because of that. Well, the truth is, and, it, and I think it's the message that we're always trying to convey on the show is that it doesn't have to be this hard. It doesn't. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's more about having the right balance. And and I think he is doing a lot of th he's trying a lot right he's doing everything Max is telling him he's doing the fasting like mm -hmm. crazy he's training he's training consistently he's doing jujitsu he's do he's doing uh, trigger sessions throughout the day I mean he's got a lot he's doing right now he doesn't need to do all that you know especially mm -hmm. being that underfed if he was fed it would be different if he said he was eating twenty hundred cal twenty eight hundred calories and he was doing all those things still overtraining. Still more than what he needs to do. Not as big of an emergency. But not as him. big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We still have lots of room we can play with, but that low of calories for his size, his activity level, he's got to come the other way. Our next caller is Dom from Texas. Dom, what's happening? How can we help you? How's it going, guys? Very good. good. Yeah. Good, good. So, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, first off, of course, say, you know, thank you for having me on. I've followed you guys pretty extensively for the last year and a half or so, and, uh, just want to say, I know Adam, you'll appreciate this, but go Warriors. How about those guys? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, buddy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that was, a, that was a shocking one, but uh, love to see it for the guys. But perfect. So, yeah, a little bit about, about me. Uh, I'm living in Austin now. My background from, I guess, a uh, physical standpoint is I played college baseball. Um, and then, to be honest, kind of let myself go afterwards. In the last couple of years, I've had a pretty big, uh, pretty big lifestyle change. I Ended up getting up to around, I'm 5'11 for reference, and played around 250, so I've always been a bigger dude, and uh, got up to around like 295, and then in January 2020, kind of flipped a switch, and in uh, October, so about 10 months in, I had lost uh, 100 pounds and got down to like 195, um, and then at that point, honestly, it was kind of around the same time I started listening to y'all, um, and... I realized that I was doing some stuff right, but um, during the progress or during the process, I'd done a lot of things wrong. And uh, your guys' show has given me a lot of insight as, you know, like what was a direct cause of what I was feeling and kind of all the symptoms of like, I basically ran myself into the ground for 10 months. And that's kind of how I, how I lost the weight and was eating in a deficit for like, um, honestly, like a year and a half. Um, so I had a lot of the side effects from that. But my uh, question to y'all wasn't really regarding you know weight loss or anything it was more kind of specific and so basically last december um i injured my back deadlifting nothing really serious i kind of just felt a pop and ended up going to like a chiropractor and he had said that it was chalked it up to like a, a sprain and about two months after i was moving and moving normally, I kind of all my range of motion back was lifting pretty heavy in most exercises, um, except for deadlift, but that really wasn't like a performance block. It was more of a mental block. So like fast forward to now, and um, I'm as strong as I've ever been in every lift, except for deadlift. Again, the deadlift has always been my best lift. When I played baseball, I could pull 500 pounds. I'd rep out 405. Um, and since then, I haven't gone above 285. And it's not like 285 is a weight that I struggle with when I do it. I just have this worry that I'm going to injure it again with one bad movement. And it really sucks because 
I love deadlifting. I've always loved dead, deadlifting. And I hate that I do have this mental or maybe it is a physical block preventing me from going heavy. But I realize that I don't necessarily have to lift super heavy in order to see the results. But my main question really is, what are y'all's opinions on different deadlift variations? Specifically, conventional trap bar or sumo, like is one form safer than the other? And will I, or will I see the same benefits from using one variation over the other? Fun, uh, fun question. Yeah, mm-hmm. good question. By the way, great mustache. <laughs> yeah. That's a very good mustache. I had it before Top Gun, so don't, don't get any ideas. <laughs> uh, okay, so so all deadlift variations are safe when performed correctly. So really the question is, uh, which deadlift variations require the most skill, right? That's where the risk mm-hmm. comes from, is some require more skill than others. A trap bar deadlift is probably the easiest to perform. It requires the least amount of skill mm-hmm. to perform, therefore you're more likely to do it properly and less likely to hurt yourself. A conventional deadlift and a sumo deadlift depends on who I'm talking to, but both mm-hmm. of them are relatively high skill. Um, how do you get back into it? You know, I'll, I'll give you an exercise I'm going to recommend that I think will be phenomenal for you to focus on that's going to lead to a very balanced, strong, stable deadlift. Single leg deadlift. Um, so on the days when you would normally deadlift, grab yourself a pair of dumbbells, try to balance on one leg, and practice single leg deadlifting and do this for like two months. Give yourself eight weeks to get really strong with a single leg deadlift. Then go back to deadlifting, whatever preferred variation you like, conventional sumo mm-hmm. or trap. And then notice how you feel. That may help you with the the mental part because you're going to feel very stable. Okay. I've done this before and it makes a very big difference in how I feel when I pull the weight off. I feel so stable and so safe because I got better at the single leg deadlift. And many times when you feel or hear a pop like that, especially when you're lifting really heavy in the deadlift, it has mm-hmm. something to do with something, an instability from left to right, right? Mm-hmm. So like you have a weakness, okay. one side's a little more dominant than there's the a other. Discrepancy somewhere. And yeah, there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. You're, you're, you're loading really heavy and that little bit of a tweak in that movement is all it took for that pop to happen. And so Sal's advice is brilliant, and this is what I would I would totally do if I was training you, is uh, we would just set a goal of, like, we're going to get hella good at the single leg deadlift. And let me tell you, so if you go back far enough on my Instagram, you can mm-hmm. you can scroll down where I, I went on a kick for the same reason, by the way. I was, I was progressing really fast in deadlift. It was back in the days when I was chasing Sal. I kind of tweaked my back a little bit, and instead of going right back to going heavy deadlift, I went back, to, I went to single deadlift. And I think I had to start... I want to say with like 40 or 50 pound, you know, dumbbells, you know, balancing. It was really hard just to do a few of those. Worked my way up to where I was hanging on to 100 pound dumbbells on each side. Then Mm -hmm. after that, went back to bilateral. So both feet on the ground, deadlifting and Mm -hmm. felt so stable and strong. So set a goal for yourself to get really good at the single leg deadlift. It's going to take a little bit of time. It's stability wise. You're going to have to regress all the way down. But what's cool, if, you, if you've if you never done this before, you'll progress fast. From I went from 40 mm-hmm. pound dumbbells to 100 pound dumbbells in like over the course of a month and a half. So really quick, oh, wow. you'll, you'll get strong there because it's probably very novel. Yeah, and you probably and haven't even done this, this uh, injury too will your uh, recruitment patterns are going to change a bit just from that. So, uh, you know, the hesitancy, um, you know, psychologically, obviously you might feel that, but also too, like your body is going to recruit a little bit differently. And this is why, uh, too, like I was going to point you into map symmetry. Do you have map symmetry? Okay. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. We'll, we'll definitely get you map symmetry because there's going to be a lot of those little inconsistencies, imbalances, um, you know, discrepancies that you're going to find, like Adam was talking about left to right, or, uh, you know, just a, a weakness in terms of like, uh, you know, a loss of, of recruitment in certain, you know, movements and, and certain like staple things that you've been doing just because your body is a very protective, uh, 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 uh body, uh, well, I'm trying to think of the word. Yeah, well, it's trying to prevent injury. <laughs> Engine. Yeah. yeah, it's trying to prevent injury. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I think symmetry is a great, uh, a great when, program to follow. When you do the single leg deadlift, start. You're going to see there's definitely going to be a discrepancy left to right. One side you'll have way mm-hmm. more stability and balance and control and better form. The other side will probably be a little off. It's super normal. Mm-hmm. Start with the the shitty side. Okay, the side that you struggle okay. with the stability and and. Wherever your form breaks down, so even if you got the strength to do more reps, but wherever your form breaks down on that on that instable, that weak side, stop it there mm-hmm. and mirror it on the opposite side. Don't 
Don't okay. let yourself be tempted to do more on the dominant side or don't start the, the exercise on the dominant side. Always start on the weak side first and then allow the the the, the uh, dominant side to mirror whatever you can do yeah, on the, the weak side. The weak side, side is going to dictate how many reps and what the weight is. Yep. Um, are you okay. familiar with the the a windmill windmill exercise? Is that the not with like uh, like dumbbells like a shoulder exercise, right? Oh uh, well, that- you can use dumbbells. Uh, you could just do it with your body. Um, so Justin did a webinar. Uh, I think it's is it Maps Prime Maps webinar. Prime webinar. In there, he demonstrates a windmill test, but you can do it as an exercise. I've found that for people who hurt them, their backs yeah. deadlifting, the windmill is a wonderful exercise to help correct some of those issues because it it it, it oftentimes comes from like the QL muscle mm-hmm. is where you get an mm-hmm. imbalance or the rotational stability is a little off. So I like windmills for you as like a, a way to prime your body before you deadlift, like I a warm that. up almost. I love that. Perfect. Okay, and in terms of the the single leg, is it more of like it's like a single single leg RDL type deadlift? Or go go on my. Do you have Instagram? Yeah, I follow you. I'll just I'll just yeah, scroll. It's not that far. It's yeah. scroll scroll down. There's and there's bending the knee. You're 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 bending yeah. the knee and like you would with a deadlift. So it's not an RDL. It's a deadlift. Oh, I leg. see. I think I think I yeah. Okay, and I remember what you're. I've seen it on there. I know what you're talking about. Okay. Now. Yep. All right. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, because I do. That's kind of the one thing I resorted to was the single leg stuff, um, especially. Cause I did notice almost right away. Um, I'm a big golfer. So when I tried to reintroduce, like I couldn't swing a golf club really for like a month. So when I brought that back, I definitely noticed, um, certain tension on one side of the body. Um, even just like walking around. So I introduced more single leg stuff like, uh, like hack squats and, um, just more lunges. Um, and I probably should do them more. I don't do them every leg day, but I, definitely should make them more um more consistent because i just like the way i feel when i do them more but i do have sort of a i one thing i'm trying to overcome is the the mental aspect of like i said i had pretty much run myself into the ground and at that point i was doing something literally seven days a week i was in between jobs so i was working at a golf course where i was getting roughly in a day like 15 to 17,000 steps and i was running up like four or five miles a day and lifting so i was super <laughs> active and then i switched jobs and now I have like this mental block to where I like before I had no problem getting every exercise I wanted to in a week because I was working out seven days a week. Whereas like now I've cut it back. Just listening to your podcast, I've cut it back to five and I probably could cut it back a little more even. Um, but yeah, it's like, that's just something I'm trying to overcome, but definitely mm. need to, to get more of that isolated stuff, isolated exercises into my regimen. Well, now you have a program. So yeah. map symmetry is all laid out. Perfect. Follow it, follow it to a T. So you could just follow it and you'll be, and you'll be set. Perfect. And I did just have one more kind of, I feel like it could be a pretty simple answer, but it's, uh, it's regarding like y'all's opinion. I know you guys have your, um, your thoughts on like cardio and how it's can be detrimental to building muscle. And I totally agree. Like I said, after running for a while, when gyms did open back up in California, I was, got me in a really dark place because I was the weakest I had been in maybe 10 years. Mm. Um, so that was, uh, definitely one of those things I mentioned kind of helped me realize why I was feeling that way, but just had a question, you know, is like sprinting or say like high intensity cardio as detrimental to muscle building in the same way that like extensive cardio is like, if I just did like sprints or I have a buddy who he's actually a firefighter and I just, send him the clip of yours on the two podcasts to go about the firefighter training. So he gave that a listen, but he's like a big, like Peloton guy. He loves the high intensity ones, but he also wants to do one of your programs. So I was saying like, how detrimental is like the short burst cardio compared to like long distance cardio? Well, here's the deal. Okay. If either one is appropriate, then, then they're both going to be okay. The the hit Mm -hmm. training now hit style cardio is more anaerobic, but if you throw that on top of a routine, and it pushes you into too much exercise over training, it's going to do the yeah. same thing. It's not going to be good. So, okay. And then the other thing is hit cardio. Uh, it requires a lot more stability and skill and mobility. So if you have, if you don't run very well, slow for long distances, sprinting, you're mm-hmm. going to run even worse and, and you're going hard and fast. Yeah. And so you'll hurt yourself. So, so those are things that pay attention to, but you okay. know, if you want to throw in some cardio and it's appropriate, I think uh, you know two or three days a week of fifteen minutes of hit cardio is is perfectly fine, um, and and okay. choose choose a method that for you doesn't require a ton of skill. Like if you feel more confident doing sprints on a bike, um, then you can do that and you'll get you'll get great results. It doesn't have to be on a treadmill. Okay, 
Perfect. Yeah, I get most of my cardio nowadays from from golf or just walks with my girlfriend. So I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna, <laughs> Dom. I'm gonna guess it's it was your QL. I'm yeah. gonna guess it was your QL because especially now that you said you have a golf swing yes. that's dominant with one side. Uh, so Sal's earlier advice with windmills is essential, especially doing it with the other mm-hmm. side that you don't rotate. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, watch that, that makes that a lot of sense. And I played baseball my whole life too, so yeah, uh, all of my turn is pretty dominant. much right, right to left. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah, going yeah. getting into my left hip is by the essential, by so. the way you'll you after, go to that webinar that justin did that we just recommended mm-hmm. go to that webinar watch it that watch the windmill and actually perform that every time before you train and actually every time before you I would golf do it every day oh yeah for you golf yeah, okay every, as much as like you cannot do enough of that because yeah. you you are so dominant one side that'll really help prime your body before you go into yeah. golfing all day long or definitely working yeah, out. and i bet the pop you felt was on one side of your back a little bit right more to the right or the left is that correct to be honest, I, I don't really remember where where I felt the pop. I just remember the pressure being kind of on my right side yeah. afterwards. Sounds mm. like it sounds mm. like QL. I'm mm. just I mean, this is just me over the over the air diagnosing. Yeah. I'd have right. to do more stuff, but it sounds like QL, especially with your baseball and golf. So windmill, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a yeah, lifesaver. It's 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 I'm like like I said, I'm like in lower body lit really anything that requires load on on my on my back or heavy leg stuff like i'm as strong as i've ever been right now and that's uh so i don't really it's i think it's a lot of it is the mental block but definitely think the symmetry stuff is gonna is gonna help also excellent all right man well thanks for calling in perfect yeah i appreciate y'all thank you again for what you do and uh have a good rest of your day take it easy dom i'll tell you what ql strains suck really bad it ruins a lot you know what else we could have recommended were suitcase carries Mm, so like walking yeah, with yeah. a dumbbell on well, one side, a lot, anti-rotational stability. stuff would be great for yeah. him too. Like, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you could, we could go down. Yeah. That makes so much sense now. Like being so right side dominant, sure. in rotational movement. It really is, you know, over the years and how long he's been doing that, it has to play a massive factor it, it, in his imbalances. If he gets good at the windmill and gets good at single leg deadlifts. He's going to see tremendous. Yo, those, th- those two alone. Huge. Just huge. get, get good at when, doing the- When did we drop symmetry? It's been a, it's been enough time. Cause I'm getting DMS now from people who've been following it so yeah. it's been it long enough right where people have been able to yeah, follow it for a few months year, right yeah so and the and i'm i'm getting crazy crazy dms i think the unilateral training the focus on that and, and balancing right to left so valuable for probably everybody not mm-hmm. just this guy but probably everybody yep our next caller is lorette from pennsylvania hey lorette how can we help you hi um just want to say hello to you, Sal and Adam and Justin. It's been a pleasure listening to your uh, podcast. Um, I have been uh, seeing my personal trainer now for um, about two months, and I'm following the uh, MAPS anabolic. I'm on phase three, and um, she gives me a lot of heavy weights. She just piles on and piles on to the point where she is assisting me with all of my lifts and you know I kind of want to know am I going in the right direction having her assist me with these lifts or should I be trying to convince her more of um, trying to have me lift within the weights that it's going to be easiest for me to get the 12 to 15 repetitions with that 30 second rest period Mm -hmm. Um, she says no just go heavy the whole idea is to make it burn go heavy um so I just want to get your take on things. So like Lorette, let, let me get this straight. She's you have good intuition. She's literally helping you lift the weight because it's too heavy for oh, you to lift. Oh, she she's literally helping me lift the weight. Um, we we have um, I have to do barbell um, curls, and she'll get under the barbell and help me lift. And I can't get maybe I can do one repetition, oh, wow. but. <laughs> Yeah. She's helping yeah. me. And if I'm doing any type of cable work, she'll um, like stand behind me earlier because I had a session this morning and it's the cable chest press for standing. She's behind me pulling the cable so that I can squeeze uh, <laughs> to get my workout in. And she's too involved. I just, <laughs> I, I, I kind of feel like I need to be doing the work myself and working my way to lifting those weights. But so you're you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Your intuition, your intuition (laughs) is right here. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So 
sometimes I tell people, Hey, tell your trainer this and you know, tell them that. And then sometimes there's just, I, you need to fire this trainer. Uh, if they're doing all of <laughs> That's this, my- yeah, if they're doing this, <laughs> That's my question. Should I fire my trainer? <laughs> yeah, you need to, we gotta they're, find you some they're yes. not a good trainer because I would literally have to coach this trainer for, a well, while. I will, I will, I will. The, it's nice that she's letting you run maps anabolic because some trainers are so <laughs> adamant about not running somebody else's But she's program. not running maps Did- anabolic. Nowhere in maps <laughs> anabolic. <laughs> she's doing half no. maps anabolic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nowhere in the program does it say, you know, have someone do forced reps. How, how did that else. go down? Did you twist her arm to let you fall? How did how did that? I'm curious to how that went down. No, she she was very um, receptive to following um, maps anabolic, but she piles on. We don't just start with 12 pounds. She just, you know, for shoulder shrugs today. We she is pyramiding me every every exercise. There's a pyramid. I'm not starting with one weight to try and get all of the reps in, you know, we're doing 25. Then we move to 30. Then we go to 35. She says, it's got to burn. You have to push yourself. You have to push yourself. Like, <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> and then that's not what the guys say. You know, what, you know what's funny? I'm going to make a guess yeah. here. This trainer is either a new trainer yeah, she's or new. She's new. She's, one of those old young. school or yeah, one of those old young. school trainers. Okay, she's, so yeah, she's, 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 she's young. She's, she's young. very young. Yeah. Um, you need to get a new trainer. So, sorry, sorry. That's that what I, I mean, here's a, here's the thing. Okay, so it wouldn't be bad. It wouldn't be bad if she was spotting maybe the last rep or two. Okay, here's the thing. When I was when I was training clients, I would pick a weight that would challenge you that you could probably do close to, if not for sure, on your own. The say the 15 reps. And as soon as my I saw my clients form maybe sort of deviate, I would get under the bar and guide the weight so they could keep mm-hmm. that rhythm going. But if you're struggling by rep oh. three, yeah. if it's already hard for you at rep three and she's having to help you all the way to 15, that's way too heavy. Yeah, and to be honest with you, even towards the end of my career when I got really good, if I saw a client's form break down uh, and they didn't complete the reps that we were aiming you for, I would, I would go lighter. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I would go lighter. Mm-hmm. So you're, she's training yeah. you too hard. The intensity is too high. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a recipe for disaster. So either you're going to overtrain right. your body. Have- or you're going to hurt yourself. Yeah, I've been asking. I've been asking her. Can we just lower the intensity a little bit? She says, "No, no, we have to go hard. We have to go hard." And she, <laughs> oh, yeah. She's That's really. We have to go mind. hard. Yeah, we yeah. have to go hard. She's, dr- and, she's drinking her rock style um, before she's training. You. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, so I, you know, I will say um, on a positive side, I have been training with her for a month, and during that time, uh, my muscle mass have, has increased by two percent my fat percentage has gone down by two percent and i've gained two pounds so i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but well loret um, before you trained with her were you doing a lot of exercise or was this kind of your were you just getting started with no i um you know i have been exercising my my journey started about 28 years ago but over covid COVID, that's when everything went haywire. So yeah. I'm back in the gym now that gyms are open and just trying to get um, get back into the flow of exercising. But I was doing it my, on my own and I thought that I needed someone to push me more. <laughs> and that's <laughs> why I went with it. a personal no. trainer. Yeah, no, so so you you <laughs> Im- you improved in spite of uh, the, the, the terrible training that she's giving you. And you'll get that yes. when you first start. When people first start, their body progresses almost no matter what, I mean, you really have to yeah. kill someone to get their body to not, not respond. Sustainable. Yeah. And that plus, you were right. you an athlete in the past? You said you worked out for a long time. I did, yeah, and just but you know, I'm an older person, I have to say, but um, yeah, I did. I started, and you know, I was at fifteen percent. This was in my late to early thirties, up into my forties, and you know, it's been really difficult. Change of life. COVID, all of that, and it all hit me two years ago. So um, I'm trying to, um, you know, improve a little bit and see if I can get my strength back. Um, Sleep's been difficult. So, um, but it's getting better. So um, I'm happy about that. But I'm really being taken through the ringer with my workouts with my trainer yeah. as much as I love her. I think she's trying to kill me, but I'm not in any pain or anything like that. So as long as I'm not dying, maybe it's okay, but I really, really wanted to, I mean, I can do it at home. I really can. Yeah. I have I, know, I, barbells, I would, I would, but I do miss. No, Laura, I would, it's, it's too hard and it's, it's heading in the wrong yes, direction. It's yeah. only been a month. So you're okay. getting away with it. 
but it's mm -hmm. it's gonna it's gonna it's not gonna end well. So I would definitely okay. uh, change directions. And then here's a piece of Thank advice you. for hiring a trainer, mm -hmm. and, I, and this is for you and for anybody else watching this: Do not hire a trainer to push you. That's the wrong <laughs> reason. I, you want to hire a trainer that's gonna guide you. Yeah. Well, you mm -hmm. you don't need a, a a drill sergeant to hammer you all the time. First of all, it's a very ineffective long term approach. At some point, you don't want somebody yelling at you, and you're gonna be over it, um, and your body's not gonna respond anymore. So. If you do hire another trainer, look at them like a, a guide. Will Is this the person that's going to guide me to developing this lifelong relationship with exercise where it's appropriate and effective forever? Not, is this person going to push me to my absolute limits in a short period of time? That's the I, don't, I don't mind a trainer for the accountability piece, but not to put like, right? So, because because I get that part, right? Like, I'm, I'm like that. Like, I know if I invest my money into something, I'm going to show up, right? I don't know if you're like that or not, but that's how I, I'm like, if I spend $1,000 on this personal trainer, I'm not going to miss that appointment because I want to lose my money. I don't mind that. I get that. There's, 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 I think there's value in having an accountability piece, but hiring someone to like push you like that. I, you just showing up and going through MAPS Anabolic, it's going to do the work. Honestly, the things that you and I would be communicating if you were climbing, especially since you had a shift and change since COVID, like your what's your work-life balance? I'd be talking about sleep. I'd be talking about the things actually outside the gym that's going on in your life. How's our balance nutritionally? How's our stress levels? Like, yeah. that's the type of stuff. I mean, what you're going to do in the gym, I think, I think that's the mistake that a lot of like clients would think is that it's such a small portion yeah. of, of, of your life. It's of a that's, fraction of the day. Yeah, it's such a small fraction of what's really going to impact your overall health and how strong you get and how much muscle and how much body fat we lose. It's all the other things. And so you and I really, why we, we'd be going through MAPS Anabolic and we'd be talking the whole time yeah, you'd be, you would be able to talk to me in rest periods and we'd be, I'd be asking you questions about your week and what's going on. And like, you'd that, be a guide that I would be diving into that stuff. That's as a good coach will do that with you. You've, especially if you got maps and a ball, you've already got a great program. So you don't even need the trainer to write a great program for you. you got that. I'd be diving into the other stuff with you. So if you are going to seek out another coach, look for someone who's going to look into that, what your, your stuff outside of the gym, cause you've got the program already. Okay. Very, very right. good. And I think the last part of my question had to do with just how crowded the gyms are. We spend a lot of time walking around the gym trying to find, mm -hmm. you know, all of the equipment we're looking for. There's a lot of times when the, the, the uh, squat racks are full and we have to go somewhere else and then we can't find a cable machine. We can't find. So um, I don't get my whole workout in. <laughs> um, and then I find the second half of the workout I have to do when I go home. Oh. So, um, you know, I'm looking for some alternatives for those exercises I can't do when the gym is um, full. And then I'm also thinking about just going back home. Um, I don't have a rack to do um, to put the barbell on, but I do have two barbells and plates and things like that. And dumbbells, kettlebells, um, okay. all of these stretchy bands. Well, Lorette, so. Lorette, MAPS Anabolic, in, in the program, when you open it, there's a dumbbells only version in there. So what I would do at the gym is when you're trying to work out and, this, and all the racks are taken, do the dumbbells only version of that exercise. Or, or you can always find a pair of dumbbells. Or train at home. Or train at home, I should right, say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if you yeah, train at home, but, if you, but I mean, you, you can always find a pair of dumbbells uh, that'll work for all these. So, that, so there are options. So if you go and you're like, oh man, this, I don't have this rack. I don't have this exercise. Yeah. Find the dumbbells only version of it. L and Lorette, it. are you, are you? Are well, you, and well, now that's when the dumbbell area is completely full. Oh, and man. the ladies have, and though the ladies and the guys, they have maybe two or three sets of dumbbells oh, God. at their bench. Yeah. And <laughs> wow. just hoarding Good old gym so life. I'm talking about yeah. yes, it's just <laughs> prime time hours. I had to run gym. through the gym. Yeah, yeah. So. No, I, I feel that. For, I feel that for sure. Uh, Lorette, are you uh, are you on Facebook? Do you? I am. Yes. Uh, let's let's add you to the forum. I'd love to to be able to stay in touch with you as you're going through this process, and so. The guys and I, I are, love that. yeah, we're going to add you to the forum. So you're in there. Okay. Any, any more questions that you have going through this process, just tag us and we'll, we'll, okay. help, we'll, we'll help guide you through this. So, so, all right. I really appreciate it guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. And congratulations to a great job you do with your program oh, and your thank podcast. You. So thank you. Appreciate I've it. I started 
From the very beginning, you guys are hilarious. So. Oh God! Oh, oh no God! Way. We were rough. We were rough <laughs> back then. Oh, you're a real fan. I have uh, episode 868. So, <laughs> oh my God! So when you don't have a new episode, I just go back to all of your old, your uh, older versions. Oh, we <laughs> we have extra love. We have extra love for people that have yeah, listened stuck around. To the, uh, uh, God to bless. To the old yes, show. yes. So, uh, I really you. enjoy it. You're our people for sure. Thank you so much, Laura. All, right. all, right. all right. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. You got care. it. Yeah. Right. Bye bye. Man, I can't believe trainers still do that. Of <laughs> course, <laughs> in a hundred percent, trainers working out. Too, you knew, you way. know, it's a new one because if it was, if it was an old stubborn one, they would have never let her run at Maps Anabolic. But that's true. Oh, she, good point. Uh, yeah. She's she's young and new enough to be like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. We'll do so, that, somebody, but we'll add to it. Sure, but yeah, I'm make it crazy hard. It. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god, yeah. it's doing all the reps for I, her. <laughs> I had a trainer like that that worked for me, and you know, she she did a good job getting clients. And I remember I had to have a tough conversation with her. And I sat her down. I said, you're beating your clients up too much. She's like, well, people always sign up with me. I said, and then they leave. They burn out. And so I had to keep having this conversation. And then it became so obvious to her. Yeah. She said, you know what? I think you're right. I need to kind of scale it back. But her thought process was, well, it's intensity. This is what workouts are about. They got to be strong. It's not me. It's them. It's their discipline. And I'm like, no, it's not working. Listen, the, the most important part, okay, Jay, this is for our training. audience is listening right now. The most important, when hiring a trainer or working, the most important part is is good programming. Once you have good programming, just following it to you. There's no need. This the 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 over hype on the intensity thing that you see on social media. So I need it, my trainer to push. The, me. You don't yeah. need that. The and then you know what the bulk of the focus is is all the other shit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You show up to the gym three days a week. You follow maps and a ball. I don't care if you follow maps and a ball. Can you never break a fucking sweat? You just follow that program to a T, and then you focus on all the other things that are going on in your life. You'll see so much more results than trying to think that it's all in that hour. That hour that you're in the gym, if I could just do more or hit it harder or go to failure or increase my intensity, but then you neglect all the other stuff, good luck. Yep. Mm -hmm. Our next caller is Sky. Sky, what's happening? How can we help you? Um. So, hi guys, first of all. Um, so, I've been a trainer for about three weeks now. And, well, last time I talked to you guys, I was still doing my school for training. So, that's awesome that I got certified and got hired and stuff. Um, so the first week I shadowed some trainers and I noticed that nobody had a written workout for their clients. Nobody really wrote down what their clients reps were or their sets or what weight they were using. So I was just wondering how important it is to track your clients workouts, um, before they come in and then while you're working out with them also. Okay. So tracking workouts, uh, I think it's important to an extent, okay? It's important because you want to be able to look back and you want to show the client progress. Sometimes a client will be like, oh, you know, am I doing better? And then you can show them and say, actually, you did two more reps. You added weight. You're doing, you know, this different, that different. So there, that's where the importance is. But what, what some trainers do is they get so hung up on tracking all the details of the workout that they, they become so focused on progressing performance mm -hmm that they don't pay attention to other things. Because progress with performance, strength, reps, that kind of stuff, it's not linear. In the beginning it is, but eventually it kind of wavers. And if you train someone for three, four, five years, they're not going to keep getting stronger. So you want to pay attention to other things. So that would be the thing I'd pay attention to. Okay, So yeah, you could track that stuff, but don't let it be the be-all, end-all. It's definitely good information, but you also want to pay attention to their energy, how they feel, their mobility, you know, their consistency, their moods, you know, their health. Do they look vibrant? Like those are the other things that you want to pay attention to as well. I think it's especially important for new trainers. And I think it's a discipline that you, they should show professionalism by, you know, really um, caring by doing the work in terms of like being able to see patterns, be able to understand your client on that level and keep track and be able to refer to them. Uh, you know, later on, but as you grow and develop more as a trainer, you start to see these patterns automatically and you start to really peer into more of the behaviors uh, that they're presenting and how to kind of move and, and do subtle things that, that will move the needle quite substantially more. But I still think this is one of those, this is one of those sort of pillars in the beginning that yeah. uh, is just a discipline that's just a good practice so you're able to understand um 
people's individual variances and needs uh, more specifically by writing down that data and not just winging it. I think if you were to look at probably all of us, if you were to peer in when we first started as trainers, I'm pretty certain that you would have caught all of us with clipboards tracking. That's right. If you were to catch, if so, if one of us were to train a client right now, you probably wouldn't see that. No. Yeah. And that's just because years and years of, of understanding what Sal was talking about, like, okay, yeah, it's good to have this data. So I get an idea when I see certain things like, oh, wow, all these things, all these numbers are going down. That's a sign of this or that. You have to learn all that. Once you learn all that, then you, you then you have, you see the cues on people because you've done it for so long. So when I was coaching, when I had trainers working underneath me, um, I would I would want that when they're when they're first starting off. And the only other time I'd probably get onto a trainer who wasn't tracking like that is if I felt like they looked distracted while my client was training with them. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the other thing that the nice thing about a carrying a clipboard and and writing down it, they look attentive. Where some trainers are get get lazy and you know they don't have a clipboard, they don't have a stopwatch, they're Great not really point. watching form. They're over there sipping on their Starbucks or looking at the cute girl that walked by, and it's like that looks awful. You know what I'm saying? I don't care how long you've been training for and how intuitive you think you can train your clients. It, if it looks unprofessional to my members, you're fucking up my business. So then I got a problem with it. But you know, if you've been doing this for long enough, like I, I don't, I wouldn't expect that. I didn't expect that from, I would never, when Justin worked for me, he had already been training a long time. I wouldn't come over to him and be like, Hey, where's your clipboard? Why aren't you writing these stats down? I trust his ability to be able to guide his clients, but he was also very attentive with his clients. If he was leaning on the machine, sipping on a latte, I'd have a different conversation with him. Yeah. Since you're new too, and I know you're, you're, you're mirroring or, you know, kind of following around other trainers, Find the trainer that you admire the most that provide that you think is the most successful, both in terms of you know client satisfaction and business, and pay attention to what they're doing that you think is working. Okay, that's that's a really really great way to learn. Okay, it doesn't mean you have to do everything that they do. In fact, they probably do stuff that doesn't work as well. But pay attention and say, what are they doing that's working? What's making? What are some of the things that makes this trainer successful with their clients? And it might just be that they can change their personality based on the client or that they tend to be in a great mood or that they have great record keeping. Right. Pay attention to those things because uh, that'll really help guide and you. And you're also going to see opportunities where you can sort of fill a lot of those gaps and where you don't see trainers doing certain things you think might help in terms of adding value. And and your clients are going to see that and potential clients are going to see what you do differently. And so I was always looking at yeah. uh, what they weren't doing and what I could improve upon and, and show, you know, the level of service I could present that would just blow everybody else out of the door. And that's yeah. how I got most of my business. So, I 100% agree with that. Yeah. I, I'm reading right now the whole question that you sent over and I, now I see the angle you're coming from. Like, that's how I would actually reframe the way you're looking at this. Instead of looking at it like, oh my God, they they all suck or they're terrible. They don't, they don't do a good job. Be like, oh yeah, there's a lot of opportunity yeah. for me to blow all these guys away because they're not doing it. So for me, okay, I came in, I had no education education. I was going through my first national certification. I was only 19, just barely turning 20 years old. So everybody was smarter and more experienced than I was. Yet within three months, I was the top trainer. And it was because of these types of things. Nobody was paying attention to their client. Nobody had energy when they were with them. Very few trainers showed up on fucking time. It was like, I saw all these opportunities on how to be more professional, more enjoyable trainer. And I wasn't even as good. They were all better than I was, but they were they were dropping the ball on so many things that I saw that were easy. It didn't take more education for me to show up on time. It didn't take more education or experience for me to be more in tune to my client while I was training them. Like So when you see those things, Instead of you being like the attitude of like, oh my God, they suck or oh, they're just like, oh wow, this is great opportunity for me to step in and be that good because they're all dropping the ball. Be undeniable. Totally. Because I'll tell you what, you go to it. So Justin, after he left uh, 24 Hour Fitness, he went over to a private facility and they were all elite trainers. Mm -hmm. Talk about that's a worse situation for a new trainer because it's intimidating. You look at there and everybody, they're checking all the boxes. They're smart. They're warming up correctly. They're all on time. They're great at marketing themselves already. So you would much rather, like you go into a commercial gym and you see everybody dropping the ball. That to me, I'm licking my chops. Opportunity. Yeah, Yeah. real soon here, I'm going to be the top dog. Sky, do you have uh, MAPS Prime and Prime Pro? Because those are really valuable programs for trainers. 
I do, so don't yell at me. Ah, uh, <laughs> not another one. I love yeah. how Well, good job, Sky. Yeah. Appreciate it. Good luck. Huh? Yeah. Good luck being a good trainer. Yeah. yeah. Hey, and use show them what time it is. Hey, I guarantee you there's a, probably a huge opportunity right there with Prime and Prime Pro. I bet very few people prime their clients before they Take work out. Take them through assessments. That's a yeah. huge differentiating oh, yeah. factor. Yeah. Yep. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, yeah. you can. Um, so I've been having some trouble with uh, the new clients that I'm getting about like the balance between letting them kind of do what they want with the workout and them not really listening to what I have to say. So like, like a goal would be strength and they kind of try to turn the workout into a body pump. Mm, yeah. And that's, I that, tell them that's how a, important that, rest is. That's a confidence thing, Sky. That's a call. That's common with me. It, it is. But here's the thing though. This is also the motivation behind why we started this. We, I don't know if you followed. You know that we have a Mind Pump Clips YouTube channel? So it is. So it, we have three channels on YouTube, and we yeah. just started the Mind Pump Clips where we break up these short things where, and I, I bet we've already covered this. Andrew, maybe Andrew can look for it while we're talking right now. But send a client us talking about it. You don't even need to. Like when I was, when I was in your spot, when I was just coming up, one of the things I did really good was where I recognized where, man, I didn't have the words to articulate this, but I knew someone who did. And I wasn't afraid to use their, their if, if I respected their opinion and like their knowledge, their experience, use us like that. Enter, like send the clip to them. And if, if, if you're or, not getting through to them. Or watch it and, and, and learn well, how yeah, to communicate. Of course, you obviously you're going to have to watch it yourself to find the clip, right? So, and that's how you'll learn though, is you you listen to us talk about it and explain it enough times. You'll start to put it in your own words, but but don't hesitate to use all this free material that we're giving you guys as coaches and trainers. So a, a lot of trainers in our forum, that's what they do is they take our, instead of them trying to put the words, they're like, here, these guys have been doing this for 20 fucking years. Let, 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 let them yeah. communicate what I'm trying to say to her. Yeah. But you know, the confidence thing's a big one, Sky, because these people hire you and what they want from a trainer is they want the trainer to tell them the path and what they need to do. Okay. And this is, there's, there's a, there's a line here, right? You don't want to be a dictator, but at the same time, you got to be confident. So I've never had a client you know, question me when I say, Hey, come here, we're doing this exercise. Like, okay, I'll follow you. No, we're, I, I want to do 50 reps. No, no, no. We're going to do five. And then we do it. Well, why are we doing five? And then I'll explain like when they feel confident because you're confident, they'll do what you say. If they feel hesitation, then they're going to wait. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to push you around and they're going to tell you what they want to do. So you got to be, you're the leader, you're the coach. You tell, and you can say that by the way, when they do this and they push back, say, look, John, you hired me because you want me to guide you. You got to do what I say. You got to trust me. And I promise you won't, ask, I will never have to ask for you again to trust me. If you just trust me this one time, like you got to be confident like that. Cause then the person's going to want to follow you. Nobody follows somebody that doesn't look like they want to lead. Right? So that's the confidence you have to display. And you do, and look, you're the trainer. So you got to give, you got to put that out there and then you're not going to get those questions. That's, that's really easily said by somebody who's very confident and has no problem talking to though. Okay. So don't be. I didn't say it's easy, but that's what you got to yeah, do. Yeah, you'll get there. Don't don't. It's not. It's okay for you to utilize people like us until you build that confidence, or while you build that confidence. Oh, that'll help because it's going to give you the information. That's, that's right, for sure, and that's yeah. and that, that and that's exactly that's exactly how I built my business. Was I didn't I didn't have the words yet. I didn't have the education yet. I didn't have the experience yet. I got it by 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 leaning on people that I knew that were more experienced, more intelligent than I was listened and read and paid attention. And when I ran into situations like this where I couldn't get through to a client that I couldn't articulate what I was trying to get across, I would find it. And I'd sent back then there wasn't YouTube videos I was sending. I'm sending like articles, you know, read this article or what that to explain what I'm trying to communicate to them, why I want them to do this. So utilize this like that. It'll help build that confidence. All right. All right. Thanks for calling in, Sky. Thank you guys so much Appreciate for everything. It. Good All luck. Right. Thank you. Man, that's so common with uh, with young trainers or new trainers. You know, imagine if you took your money to someone to invest for you, and you're like, yeah, I'd like to invest this money. You're like, what do you want to do? And they're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, what do you think? You know, you're like, yeah. whoa, shit, man. You tell me, dude. You're the, you know, you're the guy. So right. that's the, you got you got to put that out as a trainer um, when you're training your clients. You have to 
you have to put out there that you're going to do my workout. I, you hired me for, and it, and and you got to be okay saying that. Right. What's the worst possible thing that's going to happen? You you What's do, well, you do but still look strong by having by knowing somebody in your network that has answers. That's right. And, that's and the, referring because you still have the answer. You're just yes. directing it. Yeah, exactly. but the thing that the thing that I, I can totally relate to this because I actually trained like where I was at. I trained like a lot of engineers and really br brilliant people. Rockets. I had rocket scientists. I had some freaking really smart clients when I'm 20 years old. And they want sometimes they want you to explain the detail, not yeah. just tell me what to do. Right. <laughs> they want why, right. why Adam am I am I having to? Why do you want me to rest for two minutes yeah. when I'm not sweating very much? And I didn't have the words yet. Yeah, you got to have the yeah, you know, the information. So I had the confidence. You. I had the confidence to say, "Let's we're going to do this," and I would do that. But then then I get pushed back sometimes by these very intelligent people when I wasn't there yet that would go, "Well, why are we doing this?" Why aren't I doing this instead? And then I'd be like, ah, right, right, right. So th that's what, and the, and so I can relate to not having the words. Like she doesn't strike me as a not a confident person, even the way that she wrote her question and the way she's talking. I don't think she's not confident. But when you're that when you're that early on in your career, sometimes you don't have the words to explain while you're well, telling the knowledge telling them. contributes to yeah. confidence yeah. because then you know you have answers. So that that's definitely yeah. a big component. Should but put the hustle on the education piece. Like yeah. Just, yeah. just keep gathering information and data and like Shit, sign you up for here. courses and you, well, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I mean, we've gone over a lot of you I mean, almost everything. If you're a trainer and you and you and you, you literally Google and then put in the the thing. Whatever it is that and we're talking mind about, pump and we yeah, got put it. mind pump and then that and a YouTube video, a blog, a white paper, a podcast. Something. Yeah, ninety nine percent of the time it will pop up. You will fi you will find something and then and then listen, listen and learn right there and then then utilize that as as a way to communicate those until you find the words and the confidence to be able to have to have that there you go. Totally. conversation. Look, if you like our show, head over to mindpumpfree.com. Check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at MindPumpJustin. Adam is on Instagram at MindPumpAdam. And you can find me on Twitter at MindPumpSal. How do I incorporate cardio and not lose muscle? I've seen people do this before where they'll start to lose the sharpness of their muscles or they'll start to lose the sculpt a little bit. And that's disheartening. But if you do it right, then you minimize that muscle loss or that metabolism slowdown. In fact, if you do it right, you can actually speed up your metabolism at the same time that you build stamina and endurance. You just have to be able to kind of program it properly. And the way to program it improperly is just to go and do as much cardio as you can for as long as you can. Right.